for this morning and I can't wait for you to make the most out of it. So first up, we'll delve into climate change transition, exploring the latest insights to address one of the most pressing issues of our time. Next, get ready to witness the revolution of cold fusion, where we will uncover groundbreaking developments in energy production that could really revolutionize the world. And finally, we will explore quantum views on transitions. Transitions is the theme for this year. So we have explored transitions in v various aspects. We talked about mind transition, a mindset transition. That was our kickoff. We went to some bold statements such as extraterrestrial transition. We are talking about climate transition, digital transition. So this is really the main theme for this year's Science Week. So then we will close this incredible week. Uh, I will bring back Rafael Lugier, who you all know by now. Um, he's the holder of the, transi uh, the Transitions Chair here at UM6P, and we will do the closing session together. So let's make this day count, okay? And for our first session, it is my privilege to introduce to you Dr. Rani Shehbouni, Dr. Darren Tehabi, and Dr. Jawad al -Kharez. Let's give them a round of applause, please, as they are making their way to the stage. Welcome to you, gentlemen, as you are making your way to the stage. Once again, it's a privilege to have you with us here this morning. Um, you've got mics right next to you. Um, the way we will conduct this is please have a seat right here and right there, so you're in the middle of the stage. What we'll do is we will hear from each one of our esteemed speakers, we will hear from them and then we will open up to the audience for some questions. And we will start with you, Dr. Abdelghani uh, Shehbouni. Uh, would you like to talk from the lectern or here? Please make yourself comfortable as you want. I'll do a quick introduction. So Dr. Ghani Shehbouni is a doctor in hydrology and remote sensing. He received um, his bachelor is in fluid mechanics from University Paul Sabatier in Toulouse. Um, and he uh, has a PhD in hydrology and remote sensing from University Paul Sabatier in Toulouse in 92. It's such an honor to have you with us here today. Please, let's give it up for uh, Dr. Abdelghani Shehbouni. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, especially with all these young and uh, uh, talented person that, that are the future. They are the one that will realize the transition for a better world. So my presentation is in two parts. The first part is general uh, introduction about what do we mean by transition. And then I will land into transition in terms of climate change and water resources and we know how much it is important for Morocco and for Africa, especially these days, that to operate the right transition in terms of water management in the context of climate change. Please, next. Ah, Andy, Andy. So, basic, I don't see it. The notion of transition. Can team, team Tech, can we please switch on the mic, the handheld mic for uh, Dr. Shehbouni? Thank you so much. Thank you. The notion of transition has become increasingly central to future thinking. The term transition is often interpreted differently in practices than in academia. 
for example, transition in theory and transition in management studies. There are three definitions or three principal transitions. There are philosophical transition, policy transition, and practices transition. In the field of sustainability, I think that we have no other choice than adopting a policy that ensures sustainability. Sustainability is based on three pillars. Economic feasibility, social justice, and preserving the environment for future generations. So in the field of sustainability transition on Brussels, also a socio-technical system perspective then that integrates research, technology, innovation, social science, and policy. A transition perspective emphasizes system level change that results from the interaction and coordination of actions and innovation across multiple levels of scales. From a transition perspective, sustainability does not emerge as a passive consequence of consuming less but through the driving force of multiple actors that is shape transition around shared long-term vision of our future. So the field of sustainability transition seeks to conceptualize, observe, and influence change at the level of systems. It's important to emphasize the notion of system. We are not dealing with individual process. It is systemic uh, approach. The field of water transition has sought for much of its history to conceptualize, conserve, and influence change at, at the level of individual person, public, and private spheres. Scholars and academics who have conducted water-related research have typically focused on changing water end use pattern rather than water system and larger societal transition. So, with regard to climate change and its impact on water, what kind of transition do we experience and where are we heading? Let me set the stage. Morocco is losing since 30 years about 30% of its precipitation, both in form of liquid and in form of, of solid, snow and water. And we are experiencing frequent and much intense drought period. And we have been seeing this for the past 20 years. I remember we said that the only thing that we are sure of with regard to the impact of climate change is the intensification of extreme events, which means strong pronounced uh, drought, like the one that we are facing for the past six years, or strong storm and flood. And this is happened. We can see the, the, the history. We have very, very frequent, much more frequent drought than over the past. My colleague here working on what we call paleoclimatic, we have experienced during the past, I mean, to, uh, for several thousand of years, some period of, of drought, but the frequency was not that high than today. <coughs> <coughs> and the impact. Impact is less water in the soil and less water in the river. Knowing that water in the river is the one who feed the dam, Morocco put a lot of effort since the 60s in building the dam to ensure you know, water security and dust food security. But with this impact of climate change, we have less and less water coming from the wadis to the dam. 
But at the same time, you know, the nature or the, uh, the climate is not the sole responsible. We have Morocco operate a transition in terms of agricultural policy. If you see this graph, I don't, yeah. If you see this graph here, maybe I should do it here. Okay. Let me just start by, okay. Uh oh. Let me just start by 2008. 2008 is a beginning of a huge program funded by, funded, loan from the World Bank called the Green Generation. And what was the main objective of this program? Is to operate a transition from uh, uh, flood irrigation to drip irrigation with the ultimate objective of, sa of saving water. So this transition that it was a very good idea because as you know, as you know the flood irrigation, you have about 50% of water is going up to the atmosphere through evaporation from soil, which he, the plant is not using, which is, in terms of agronomy is lost. Maybe in terms of climatology, of hydrogeology, it's not lost, but in terms of agronomy, is lost. Everything that goes to the atmosphere is lost. So what we experience within this transition is, besides the transition from, uh, from flood to drop irrigation, we have another transition from annual to perennial crops. You can see how it increased the number of perennial crop, which is typically within this period of green generation and now uh, Moroccan green. Why? Why this transition? It's for economical reason. One hectare of wheat will bring you $1,000 a year as income. One hectare of olives will bring you $10,000 a month. One hectare of orange tree will bring you $12,000. So the driver was financial driver, especially since the people are operating these changes, they are taking fully advantage of the funding from the state, subsidy, 80% of the cost. But this has not been done in very well in my sense, because the need for water of fields of wheat is half need of water of, of olive tree or oranges. Furthermore, the season of wheat or barley is three, three to three and a half months. Well, if you have oranges and olive, you have to irrigate them every day throughout the year. As consequences of this, As a consequence of this, it was a huge increase of water consumption. If you take into account the shortage of precipitation and snow, which deliver water to the dam, which means that this water is coming from the groundwater. Okay? Additionally, since there is incentive from the government, a lot of surfaces that used to be rain for agriculture, that are outside of what we call irrigation districts, has increased tremendously. You can see the differences in these two maps. The green part is the extension 
of Peruvian agriculture outside the irrigation district, land that used to be uh, used to be rainfed irrigation. It is incredible. The consequences are very clear. Less water, more need of water, we pump. And, and here, in the region of Marrakech, the region of Marrakech, in all the parts of the region, we have a strong drop of the water table. And in other parts of Morocco, it's worse. In Agadir, for example, the pumping the, uh, here in Marrakech is about, you know, uh, the waste is, you know, about 120 to 160. In Agadir, it's 300 meters. The other side effect of this over pumping is seawater uh, intrusion. If you take a region like Walidia, we used to be the big producer of tomato in Morocco. With the pumping near the coast, there is this water inclusion, and now the farmer has abandoned the land. There is no tomato produced in Walidia anymore. We used to have plasmatecha, <laughs> you, know, pla uh, you know, tomato playa. This is actually, this brings me to a reflection about this transition that Morocco operated in the 80s through the, through the recommendation of the World Bank, a recommendation of whatever the uh, monetary fund, which was based on the theory that the government, the state, has to stay away from the business and to let the market auto-regulate. See why we end up having watermelon in Zagora, in Jad? I don't think so. Especially for water. Because the state has to be an actor, not just a an, an referee. <laughs> has to be an actor. Because it's the state's responsibility to ensure that future generation will have some water. You know, if you go to the history, a lot of civilization disappeared because there is no water. A lot. In all over the world. So, for strategic issue like water, I believe that the government had to be a key player. And the example that we have seen lately during the COVID, you know, World Bank and, and the Monetary Fund, since the 80s, they say the government has to take his hand of the business. Let the private company. What's happened during the COVID? I have a lot of friends that are doctors and they have their, their clinics. What they did, they closed their clinics and they went to their farm. Who put up with the crisis of the COVID? It's public hospital. And this is the biggest demonstration that we shouldn't let for strategic issue like health, water, food security, let the private company run the show because they are looking for their business today. When I was in Arizona, for example, there is this city called Bisbee. It's, it's in the border of California. Bisbee was a flourished city, mining city, copper mine city, that, that was run by a private company. What's happened to this city is, up, after a couple of years of extracting the copper, the amount of copper to be extracted it became less and less. What the company did? They just left. They just left. And let the population there. 
This is why I think that the state has to be, has to be an actor. So in this kind of situation, what can we do? We shouldn't cry about the past. Let's take the future. Regarding water, as you know, Morocco, in Morocco, 87 of available water is used by irrigation, by agriculture, with an efficiency, according to FAO, less than 55%. That keeps this number. 87 of available water is used by agriculture, and the efficiency of irrigation is less than 57. So, in my sense, in addition to all effort that the government is doing through the water treatment, through the water desalinization, my colleague Jawad maybe may say a word about desalinization, emphasizes has to be put on optimization of irrigation because there is where we can make a lot of saving. And we have the expertise to do so. We have the expertise, people, myself, my colleagues here, have been working on this issue for 30 years. Let me give you some example. So here, just, you know, just take the region of Marrakech. This is the consummation that has been uh, unregistered, and this is the needs. And we can make a gain of both for orange tree and for um, olives. To put this gain in perspective, I, can, I will provide some numbers here. The number of a hectare of olive orchid in the region is 175,000 hectare. Number of orange in the region is 60,000 hectare. I think that we can buy uh, proper management. Technology is there, the know-how is there. What it is lacking is the political willingness to do so. We can save up to 143 million cubic meters from well, olive trees and about 40 million in orange trees. To put this in perspective, the city of Marrakech needs 60 million cubic meter. Here, my, my group here did some, uh, some, uh, some economic analysis. They can save a lot of money. So basically, where, where you are discussing with the farmer, talk to their pocket, don't talk to their mind. <laughs> Just emphasize this. This is the saving that you are going to make in terms of what a cost, because we did all the math. Uh, of course, people who are buying water from them, there is no that much dam now. People are using solar energy, using gas, using electric, etc., etc. We should make a demonstration in the field with the farmer, showing them what the gain in terms of money, in terms of the pocket, can make if they manage well the irrigation. So, what to do? As I said, there is no silver bullet. No one size fits all. We have to go through all the process. The crisis is so tense that we have to go Every drop counts. All the, all the possibilities that exist. You know, we have to change our way of, of living and consuming. This is very important. I don't need 
to have, let's say, watermelon in, in March. I can wait until August, which is a normal season. I think that the population, if they change their way of consuming, they will force because it will be no market for the producer. Okay? Use the most up-to-date science and cost-effective technology for water treatment, water desalinization, smart agriculture, etc., etc. What is the next one? So, to summarize, you know, the issue is about society, policy, innovation. This is triangle. We can, I mean, as, as academic, we cannot stay in our tour d'ivoire. We have to integrate the three dimensions, you know, the policy dimension, innovation, etc., etc. Unfortunately, this is the situation today. This is the biggest dam in Morocco, 2013-2023. As, as Claude, uh, Claude in remark, I would say, I would quote Einstein when he says, it is true for water issue, environmental issue, entire society. The world will not be destroyed by the bad guys. The world will be destroyed by the one who watching this and not doing anything. I will not under salut. Merci. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Shahbouni, for uh, these very important insights on water management and uh, the serious issue of water shortage. Thank you again for your presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is a leader of NASA's SMAEP, the Soil Moisture Active Passive, research, so it's the water research team. His research and discoveries range from hydrometeorology to hydroclimatology. He is professor of Earth, Atmosphere, and Planetary Sciences at the MIT. Please welcome Dr. Dara Intikhabi. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak, and if I may try your patience for a few minutes. In this session on climate change, I'm going to talk about the coupling of the water and carbon cycles, which is basically saying plants. Plants are, uh, whether they're natural vegetation or they're crops, they're the largest source and sink of carbon in the system. So what happens to plants in a transition to a changed climate is of first order importance because that's our biggest term, the carbon budget. And also, it's the basis for nature-based solutions to climate change. Is it uh, management of agricultural systems or reforestation? So um, it's part of the solution and also part of one basic understanding of where we're headed. So uh, let me begin with uh, plants and how the water and carbon is really, when we talk about water and carbon cycles, we're talking about plants. Um, they uh, are fundamentally based on photosynthesis, which basically is the chemical balance that I show here. It uh, takes carbon dioxide, plants take carbon dioxide from the air in gaseous form, and uh, water that's ultimate H2O that ultimately comes from soil water. They uh, also have an input, the uh, yellow arrow of uh, solar energy and they transform it to various types of sugars. So on the right-hand side, you see a sugar, and they also emit uh, oxygen into the atmosphere, which the, is the air we breathe and uh, rely on. So it's basically turning carbon dioxide in the air into sugars that become the body of the plant. But plants um, have evolved uh, into many diverse forms in order to deal with um, light limitation, that yellow arrow, and water limitation, and also nutrients. 
and also they deal with disease and disturbances. So they have developed all sorts of strategies around that basic photosynthetic uh, uh, balance equation to adapt to all these disturbances. So this is the tree of life, um, in, uh, which starts at the center, a very basic life form millions of years ago, that then branches into different species to deal with those crises that I have uh, on the left for the plant or stresses. And then they radiate out into more and more different types of plants and um, uh, flowers and such. So this is the tree of life, the outer branches are, are what we see today. But they originated from some basic form millions of years ago. And they share, uh, some species shared pa parental traits. Now, um, ecology, or botany to be more exact, and agronomy are disciplines dedicated to understanding this outward radiation of species. Why do they uh, uh, differentiate or divide into different species? Now, we need that understanding to uh, now to estimate the future carbon sink and achieving food security. This sort of modern applications of this body of knowledge that botany and agronomy have produced. And ecologists and, or botanists and agronomists have developed their method of research or method of science by looking for more and more differences among species. So they're always in search of going down the branch and defining new branches and understanding how further radiation is happening. And there's good reason for why they developed their scientific method that way. By looking for more and more differences, they have produced field evidence for survival as the basic survival of the fittest, as the basic driver of evolution. You need to see the radiation out into uh, subspecies to do that. They have uh, understood nature versus uh, nurture. Uh, are heredity traits more important or the environment more important? And also now the, um, it's not just evolution on a, uh, in a species or population scale, but genetic change in an individual plant, which sort of bridges all of these. So this uh, scientific method of looking for more and more differences has had its value in establishing these disciplines. Notice that the arrow is pointing out is your scientific method is going to more and more species. But what if the, we reverse the arrow? Instead of looking for differences, we look for commonalities among plants. What does that tell us about uh, plants and the water and carbon cycles and how do we evolve and uh, whether nature-based solutions or the carbon budget uh, future will be? There is value in that, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Are there fundamental similarities among how plants provide the link between water and carbon cycles? Now, that is um, um, in space. Different types of plants occur in different parts of the world. Why? Is there a clue in that about how they will behave in the future? So. Um, Basically, what I'm arguing is that we have a natural experiment. In our current world, there are different species of plants in different parts of the world due to the climate and nutrients and uh, other limitations. Can we, by looking at the current distribution, get a clue about how they evolve in time or how plants evolve in time, especially further and further up the tree of life? So. If this hypothesis can be um, um, tested and validated, then responses at the site, time variations in how plants behave in their coupling of water and carbon cycle, should resemble how plants distribute across sites in different climates. The bottom part we can observe is today, across sites. Is there a clue in how plants have developed in different parts of the world about how, what they will do in the future? 
So is there a fundamental space for time trade-off in plants? So the natural experiment is this. We know and observe quite accurately, um, using satellites mostly, the gross primary productivity, which the units suggest what it is. It's grams of carbon per unit area of land per unit of a day. So we have the natural experiment that we can observe today of this distribution. Can we infer from this distribution how they would behave in future time? That's the question. So let me uh, just uh, for um, disclosure, the variables I'm going to use very quickly and the data I'm going to use, I'm not going to dwell on them too much, but I'm going to use um, a measure of evaporation, specifically evaporative fraction, which is the fraction of the available energy at the surface due to solar radiation principally that is used to vaporize water as you need energy to vaporize water as you need um, to turn on the um, uh, stove to boil water and transform it from liquid to gas. So evaporative fraction is basically water availability, let's say, non-dimensional between zero and one. I'm also going to use gross primary productivity, which is just defined as basically carbon uptake by plants. And there's a, uh, instruments developed to uh, do that from space. A very interesting one is solar-induced fluorescence. Um, in the very top, you see the uh, solar radiation coming in. That's the little arrow, yellow arrow that I had. Most of it is used in photosynthesis, like I described. But some of it is released as heat. And a small amount of it is fluoresced. That means it's re-radiated back to the atmosphere in a different frequency, over and above what the sun is putting in. And if you have a satellite instruments that can measure that excess, you are measuring photosynthesis. So this instrument is um, it's a really neat one and it's out there. And the list of satellites for disclosure, uh, what they are. So let's start the experiment. Let's look at the average time mean distribution of gross primary productivity across the globe as a function of this time average water availability. What we see that unlike the uh, photo basic photosynthetic equation that I showed, there is a distinct nonlinear behavior. So this nonlinearity is something that plants through their uh, radiation out have developed the chemistry, physiology that leads to this nonlinear behavior. Okay, so this is important is that it shows how uh, plants have adapted to different climates in today's natural experiment of where they are. Um, now we go in time. These are three uh, locations where we measure evaporation directly. Uh, from arid to humid, just to see what the climates do. And now, this is at a site. These are monthly avail water availability versus carbon. And year to year, there's variations. There's a dry year, there's a wet year. And at any one site, we see that they also go along a curve. Different parts of the water availability, because you go from arid to humid. but there's also a little curvature, which is curious. Now, this is just three sites. We have many sites. So let's put them all together, and you see that's what's on the left-hand side. The right-hand side are tropical forests and boreal forests where it's light limitation. Water is not an issue. So where water is an issue, you see this curvature, which is curious, in time. Each one of those lines is a different location. Now, in order to remove the location information and sort of bring order to all this data, we look at the slopes across all sites, regardless of vegetation. And the slope, the middle curve, is DGPP, DEF, the slope, versus water availability. And then we integrate this curve from the origin, no water, no plants and we get back the GPP versus monthly EF. So now this is the same curve, but in time. 
And when we put them side by side, the left hand side is what, how they behave in space and the right hand side is how they behave in time. And we see the same nonlinear curvature. So by combining all the vegetation types around the world into one graph, we have moved up the tree of life into what is fundamental across species and not how each plant, why each plant looks different. It's sort of what is the fundamental role of chlorophyll and photosynthesis in the system. So the spatial distribution, the natural experiments, gives us a very good clue about what happens in time, how the system behaves in time. And it goes up and down a same curve. Now, that, the left-hand side plot is what I just showed, based on flux stations, so individual in situ based, ground based measurements. The two graphs on the right are satellite based of the same quantity. Two entirely different instruments. So ground based and two entirely different satellite technologies all show the same natural experiment. Now, climate models, the ones that we use to project uh, uh, what may happen in the future, these are just four out of maybe a dozen climate models that are run around the world. They're all over the place. They don't match um, the natural experiment we have today. That's why we need these observation-based analyses. Let me jump um, to this. So let's make a conceptual framework, not a model for this dynamical behavior that we see. The two variables are water availability, evaporative fraction, and gross primary productivity. And it's as a dynamical system, they relate to each other through a function. But we don't know what that function is. That's the whole problem, right? It's a dynamical system, and let's treat it that way. It's not a model. It's a conceptual framework for how these two variables relate. That function, for those of you, uh, um, in high school math, you should know Taylor series. So we can expand this function into zeroth order, which is a constant, first order, which is a linear slope, second order, quadratic, cubic, and so forth. Eventually, if you have enough terms, you get the full function back. But let's just keep the first two terms, the linear term and the... Uh, so that would be the first order dynamical system we don't know what A1 to A4 are, but we can use the satellite data, just ordinarily least squares, to get those coefficients based on the data itself. And the four graphs are A1 to A4 based upon the satellite data. So we have identified the dynamical system to first order based on just observations. Now, a little um, algebra here. When you have a dynamical system that has a transition matrix A, that matrix A can be decomposed into eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What that is, is just an algebraic operation that allows you to rewrite the top equation, which we had, as the bottom equation. That the dynamical system has two exponential terms in time. So it's moving in two different directions, and any movement is a combination of those two. So lambda 1 and lambda 2 are two time scales. And v1 and v2 are two directions in which the dynamical system moves. It's the exact same equation as the top, just transformed algebraically. And graphically, it looks like this. This is the evolution of gross primary productivity versus evaporative fraction resulting from that equation. So the red lines are the eigenvector directions, and the intersection is the equilibrium point. It's a dynamical system. You go to an equilibrium point, hopefully, not uh, explode. And then the arrows are the fast and slow time scales that you do that. So we have taken the dynamical system based on observations as a conceptual framework and determined the directions and the time scales of evolution and there happens to be two of them, which is 
the building block of the space-time uh, trade-off that I mentioned. It's interesting that the fast time scales, the top left, is on the order of a few days, zero to eight days. The sign doesn't matter here. The time scale is the time scale of dry down after a rainstorm. It's very fast. And the eigenvectors, the directions of movement, are, is a negative slope. From the right, as the rain wets the soil and water is available, you move to the left in the top right figure, your carbon assimilation, your carbon uptake goes up. The plant is happy. It's got water and physiologically it responds by taking more and more carbon out. But when you go to the slow time scales, it's actually uh, positively uh, uh, sloped, very much like the, uh, what we saw before as the uh, um, across sites, across space. So the slow time scales is what eventually is traded off in space and not the physiological response. So let me just go to the conclusion. We find that there's an equivalence between the natural experiment of where the vegetation are around the world and how they respond to water availability versus a slow time scale in individual population response in time if we separate out the slow and fast time scales. So it is possible to use this natural experiment of today, satellite observations, to look at the future evolution of the system. So this is the natural experiment. And uh, the question, are there fundamental space for time trade-offs? The answer is yes, but you have to work on the data. And uh, basically what this says is that up the tree of life, when you get to the fundamental nature of all vegetation, they behave the same. The way they distribute themselves in space has clues about how they behave in time to water stress. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daran Tihabi, for your presentation. We very much appreciate your expertise. Now, ladies and gentlemen, our next uh, speaker is the Executive Director of the Regional Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, which is an intergovernmental organization with diplomatic status based in Cairo with around 20 Arab countries on board. He brought in over 20 years of experience in uh, different sustainable energy fields, including energy policies, wind and solar energies, green hydrogen, just to mention a few. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jawad Al-Kharraz. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, a pleasure to be with you today. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to thank UMCSP for inviting me today. I've been here for a couple of times, and every time I come, it's, uh, there are new things, new facilities, and uh, I mean, uh, new programs, so I'm really uh, impressed by the, the progress being done by uh, UMCSP. Um, so we are talking about transitions, and before, I mean, uh, uh, starting my presentation, um, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to talk briefly on, on the transitions I've been witnessing, or I've been living myself in my career, I did my PhD at the University of Valencia, Department of Thermodynamics. I started working with satellite data to obtain uh, biophysical parameters to, uh, to do some applications like how to improve water use efficiency in agriculture using satellite data. How can we use uh, satellite time series to, uh, uh, to study the, the change of land cover in the Mediterranean region, as you already mentioned, I mean, the, the climate change impact uh, uh, on the, the land cover, on water resources, etc., was, I mean, a very uh, uh, big in the last decade. And also, I remember I had participated in one uh, uh, field measurement campaign in the north of Finland uh, with the European Space Agency to uh, measure some parameters, temperatures around the trees and the boreal forest of the north of Finland, in Lapland, and some other teams were measuring fluorescence and other parameters, I mean, to find the, uh, the relationship between 
this forest and uh, absorption and emission of CO2. Because years uh, earlier, uh, one of the eminent uh, uh, researchers in the US, Mianini, has published in Nature something that somehow the Bush administration used to justify you not know, signing Kyoto Protocol 92, sign, saying that the absorption of CO2 by the boreal forest in Alaska is higher than the whole emissions of the industry in the US. So uh, uh, it's important to, uh, uh, I mean, to obviously when we talk about science, to connect with the other, uh, uh, I mean, with decision making, with, with society, and also with industry. I already mentioned by, uh, by Dr. Ghani. So I was working more in remote sensing and uh, 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 finding out applications in the water sector, uh, etc., and also climate change. Then I moved to France. Uh, I had uh, an occasion to work in an international organization based in France uh, to support the Mediterranean government in developing what we call national water information systems. So this led me to work on different aspects of water management and water policies. So it's clear that we cannot manage something uh, that you cannot measure. So it's very uh, it's not obvious and not easy really to uh, uh, collect all the, ne the needed data, harmonize it, and interconnected between different stakeholders in the country. For example, in any country you find data scattered uh, between different stakeholders, the ministries, uh, river basin agencies, uh, you know, different offices. So how can we, this data be interconnected so the decision maker at the level of ministry or wherever can take the right uh, measurement, the right decision, sorry. And the same is happening in the energy sector. So after years there, I moved to, uh, uh, to Oman, Sultanate of Oman. I've been in charge of the research program in desalination. So we are talking about the impact of climate change on water resources, and uh, uh, desalination now become like one of the, the main solutions of water supply. Uh, so desalination uh, in Oman and the Gulf countries is, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, almost uh, cities are relying on desalinated water. So desalination is technology which is in energy intensive. So it's a, a water energy nexus example where we need a huge amount of energy to produce fresh water from seawater or brackish water. Uh, uh, in the case of uh, uh, all, many coastal areas, we have the seawater intrusion problem. Again, this is another impact of climate change. So when we have this problem of seawater intrusion, so we get the groundwater more, more salty. So we need desalination to, to be able to use this water for agriculture or for drinking, etc. And in this time, also, I, I, I came across a problem that happened in the coast of Oman, which is the harmful algae blooms. So this is a huge concentration of microalgae, which happens because of, again, climate change, the rise of seawater temperature, the rise of nutrients of the industries, I mean, nitrogen, phosphorus, etc. So that makes the proliferation of this uh, algae in the sea. And this causes a problem for desalination plants and for power plants. Desalination plants, because the intake system in the sea uh, can get stuck, so the, the flow of water decreases to the plants. And if these microorganisms go into inside the plants, they destroy the membranes, because now almost plants are uh, uh, RO or membrane-based uh, technology. And a power plant also for their uh, cooling water in the intake, intake system, the same problem. So if we have this um, phenomena, so it impacts the, the, the power plant. So you see how connected are the different I mean, areas, I mean, remote sensing, climate change, water, energy. So after years in Oman, I moved back to, uh, I moved back to the Mediterranean in Egypt now. So I'm, I'm in charge of, uh, uh, um, I mean, providing technical assistance to our member states, Arab countries, in areas of renewable energy, energy efficiency, so to support our member states in their energy transition uh, journey. So energy transition is important. Uh, um, uh, uh, is one of the most important areas where we can really uh, uh, help in mitigating uh, uh, emissions, mitigate the impact of climate change. If you saw in the COP28 in Dubai, one of the main outcomes was to, uh, 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 to triple renewable energy uh, uh, by 2030 and uh, double the efforts of energy efficiency yearly from now to 2030. And, uh, and obviously this needs an acceleration of energy transition. Energy transition means a transformation or a shift from a fossil fuel uh, uh, energy system uh, to a renewable energy system base. So uh, uh, it's important really to accelerate energy transition in worldwide and in particular our region, the MENA region and in Morocco in particular. Um, 
so we are targeting 11 terawatt by 2030. So uh, this is a huge target, but it's, it's, it's very important to really set a very ambitious target in a way to push, I mean, the, 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 the policies, the investment towards achieving such a, such a goal. Sorry, I'll come back. Uh, so, uh, um, where we are and where we, we need to be. So, obviously, the international community, so in, in the COP28, we, we, we met scientists, decision makers, academia, different kinds of stakeholders really to come together uh, uh, to set ambitious goals and also help really to develop the right environment at level of policies, regulations, uh, the right financial mechanism to really uh, uh, support renewable energy projects and energy efficiency projects. So it's clear that we need a lot of effort at the level of renewables, energy efficiency, electrification. Now we are talking about hydrogen, another uh, area where, again, this initiative could be important because to produce green hydrogen, we need uh, renewable energy and we need high quality water. So in a region such as ours, which we, we, with uh, acute water scarcity, probably this region would be a solution for this, uh, uh, for this uh, 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 green hydrogen. Um, so, key milestone and actions for rapid emissions reduction, I mean, uh, up to 2030. So the idea is really to, uh, uh, to reduce emissions by almost 62% by 2030. So in order to achieve net zero by 2050. Many countries across the world, they set this goal of net zero. So no emissions by uh, 2050. So this is, I mean, needs a lot of things to be done. At level of renewable energy, so we need to increase the share of renewable energy in the production of electricity. We need to uh, uh, also uh, uh, to uh, develop, I mean, uh, 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 many measures in terms of energy efficiency strategy, but also we need to, as we said in COP28, uh, transition away from fossil fuels. And this is not easy because some countries are resistant to that and because obviously fossil fuels uh, are contributing to the many economies. So it's a, it's a little bit challenging to, uh, to convince such countries to, uh, to accelerate energy transition uh, 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 process. Uh, so a huge investment are being done or, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 put in, in, in this uh, energy transition process. You can see distributed uh, uh, over different kind of, uh, of renewable energy. And uh, last year, for the first time in, in, in the history, we got uh, uh, 1.7 trillion US dollar invested in renewables uh, in front of 1.1 only in, in, in fossil fuels. So this is uh, actually, uh, uh, I mean, a very interesting uh, 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 point. So I hope that this obviously will continue in order to uh, achieve this uh, 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 ambitious energy transition uh, goal. Um, so why energy transition is needed? So obviously because energy is w one of the main contributors to uh, the, 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 the emissions, to the, the climate or the global warming. So uh, it's clear that we need to, uh, um, uh, to invest in, in, uh, in uh, improving energy efficiency and more and more renewable energy in different sectors, either electricity, uh, uh, transportation, manufacturing, in the building sector, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, again, is needed because, I mean, there is no way to, to save this goal of 1.5. Now we are talking about 2 degrees because 1.5 probably is almost impossible. So let's save this goal of 2, 2 degrees by 2100 uh, 2, by, I mean, really accelerating this uh, energy transition and really uh, 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 reach net zero by, by, by 2050. So I'm not going to go into details. I mean, Obviously, energy transition has many, many, uh, 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 I mean, uh, 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 advantages. I mean, obviously, it will contribute to energy security, uh, um, commercial balance for many countries, uh, energy subsidy reduction. So many countries, in particular, hydrocarbon producers, they are, I mean, reforming their uh, subsidy system. Uh, economic growth engine, so many countries, so this uh, transition will help them. I mean, accelerate and, uh, and uh, increase the economic growth, uh, fight against energy poverty, provide more access to energy. I mean, in Africa, more than 600 million people don't have access to electricity. This is huge. So a lot of effort to be done at this level. Obviously, that will shift the whole economic uh, uh, system. I mean, creation of jobs and uh, also uh, 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 big impact on the, uh, the society as well. Um, so it's about a win-win situation for both energy net importing countries and energy net producer uh, uh, countries. Um, so uh, uh, everyone is talking about decarbonization, decarbonization of the whole 
the all sectors. We need to decarbonize the transportation sector, the building sector, the industrial sector by more renewables and by more energy efficiency uh, uh, in the in this uh, in the sectors. Um, share of electricity in final energy consumption will reach around 50% by 2050 in some countries. I mean, compared to 20% currently. Large electrification process of final use in all sector. This is a goal, uh, a very ambitious. It's feasible, uh, but it's not obviously easy to, to reach if we don't really uh, uh, do huge efforts. Uh, in terms of technology, because we are relying on technology and science inputs, definitely. Whether it comes to power generation, electrification of different uses, the renewable energy for direct thermal uses, energy efficiency. So we need really an implementation at uh, a different sectors uh, uh, level. So you can see just examples of the transport sector. So the main drives energy decarbonization. So uh, modal change, energy efficiency in cars, massive introduction of e vehicles, uh, electric electrification of railways in the industry, energy efficiency in different processes of, uh, of industry, building. So uh, we can do a lot in terms of, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, insulation and, uh, and uh, uh, solar heaters, for example, uh, etc. agriculture. Uh, uh, renewable could you, you be use, used for pumping water or groundwater, could be used for desalination, so, uh, and power sector. So also we need, uh, uh, I mean, massive renewable energy integration into the grid. In, in, in parallel with the more deployment of renewables, we need more infrastructure, so more power grid and more interconnections connection, also between, between countries. Um, in the MENA context, I will go quickly. So the MENA region, so we are suffering from, uh, from, from climate change. It's uh, reflected in many aspects, in increased heat waves. We are witnessing the last summers in drought, in, in flash floods. Um, uh, according to the, the, the global carbon budget 2023, so uh, the MENA region is approximately responsible of 6.7% uh, of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, this is an increase of, uh, from 6.2% in 2020. So as you can see, in, uh, fossil fuel combustion is like 75%, followed by industrial process, 15%, and agriculture, uh, 10%. Uh, in the center, we are producing what we call Arab Future Energy Index. So a sort of indicator, we collect data from our member states, and we try to assess the progress of, of our countries vis-a-vis -vis their goals of renewables, energy efficiency, and access to energy. So obviously, there's a lot of work in terms of the collecting data, in terms of assessing many aspects, the market structure, the policy framework, the capacity at the level of institutions, finance and investments, carbon emissions, and monitoring. Uh, so we can just roughly some figures. Uh, uh, in the Arab countries, actually, if we include all the MENA countries, Middle East and North Africa countries, we're reaching almost 36 gigawatt uh, uh, right now. So the idea is to triple by 2030, but I think we have the capacity to quintuple, I mean, five times uh, we can reach uh, of the share of renewables by 2030, but obviously it's conditioned by, by uh, uh, many, many efforts to be, to be done and continued. Morocco was a, one of the pioneer countries in the region to push the renewable energy agenda ahead, I mean, from the, the highest sphere, from his, uh, 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 from our king and uh, from different governments, we were pushing the renewable energy project, and we have the, po the objective of 52% by 2030 of renewables and 20% of uh, improvements of energy efficiency by, by, by 2030. Many other countries are also on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, also on the same stage. Saudi Arabia, UAE, they are doing a huge effort. Oman, uh, uh, Egypt, uh, Jordan. Uh, and Tunisia as well. So that's required a lot, a lot of, uh, of improvement at level of policies, at level of regulatory framework, supportive, uh, I mean, regulations, supportive financial mechanism, uh, uh, opening the, the, the sector for, for private sector. It's important to push PPP, public-private, uh, uh, I mean, uh, partnership. So over power uh, purchase agreement, PPA, over 20, 25 years. So we, we really uh, 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 use it, some of the, 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 the very innovative financial mechanism like feed-in tariff, auctions, competitive bids, that's, that led to very, very competitive uh, electricity prices. We're talking about one cent dollar for solar in Saudi Arabia, or uh, two cents dollar uh, uh, per, uh, for solar in, uh, in, in Egypt, or uh, one, um, um, uh, uh, 0.24 for wind energy in, in Egypt. So uh, this is just, I mean, uh, so as you can see, so different kind of policies really to push, I mean, this, uh, this sector ahead. Um, a lot of projects are in the pipeline, so we are witnessing a lot of projects in the pipeline of renewables, in particular PV, we have huge I mean, potential, huge onshore wind energy project as well, some uh, biomass or biofuel uh, also project, geothermal in some, in some countries. 
uh, so uh, uh, again, so there is a political will, there is an improvement in policies and regulation and financial uh, 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 mechanism, uh, uh, and it's obviously this creates the right environment for the investors and for the private sector to invest in such, uh, in such sector. Energy efficiency, probably we did less effort, unfortunately. It's, it is the only region in the world where energy intensity is increasing. It's almost a double of the, uh, the world average. It means that for the same product or service, we are consuming I mean, double of energy than uh, other areas of, uh, of the world. So obviously we need more effort in this, uh, in this area. We need to remove, remove subsidize. I mean, we need to, uh, uh, I mean, this is some uh, figures on electricity prices uh, from renewables in the region. Uh, we in the center helped the countries develop what we call national energy efficiency action plan. And we try to help them develop, implement in the, the, the action plan and monitoring the different uh, uh, areas of uh, energy efficiency, in particular building sector and appliances. So I'm not going to go into details. Energy access. So uh, uh, almost countries have a good access to energy, but six or five countries are less, unfortunately, because of the political and economic situation of some countries, like Yemen, for example. So it's not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the right, uh, I mean, uh, situation we, where we can really improve the, the energy access. But obviously, that's helped also in, in the proliferation of uh, of solar PV uh, in Yemen, in Lebanon, in Syria. Uh, now everyone is talking about green hydrogen. This is the future. It could be career for energy. So uh, throw what we call electrolyzer. We uh, throw using renewables and high quality water. We can produce uh, this green hydrogen that could be used. Uh, I mean, could be stored. Could be used in few, few, uh, 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 fuel cells. Uh, it has many applications, including green ammonia, green methanol. Uh, OCP has just. Uh, a couple of months ago, announced the investment of 13 billion US dollar in, in, in uh, green ammonia, starting producing 1 million ton by 2027. This is very, very promising. Uh, so, I um, just want to wanna wrap up. So, uh, uh, again, green hydrogen this is the future. So, in Morocco, we have a big potential because we are very close to the market, particularly the European market, where there is a need uh, in, the, in the, uh, the upcoming decade. So, we have all the ingredients. We have a good infrastructure. We have interconnection. We, we, we have, uh, I mean, uh, uh, cheap, one of the cheapest renewable energy, uh, of, of, I mean, uh, electricity prices. We have also uh, uh, knowledge, and uh, uh, now we have very good institutions like Erizen and uh, UMCSP and, uh, and institutions that are working in the area. So those are all ingredients that will place Morocco in the, in the, in the front in terms of uh, the MENA region as pro probably exporter of green hydrogen and its, uh, its uh, derivatives. So uh, finally, I will just go to the final, uh, final slide. So uh, energy transition needs to a win-win situation for all types of countries. Energy transition process is accelerating to fulfill the COP28 goals of tripling renewables and doubling energy efficiency by 2030. Energy transition in the MENA region will need serious readiness process. So I mentioned already different key, key, key factors. It's important to capture the immense value of sustainable energy business and effective PPPs uh, uh, to help advance the ecosystem. A careful design of enabling framework, legal, regulatory, tariffs, contractual, etc., are important. Another aspect is technology uh, localization. So we cannot repeat the errors of the past. In the, in the, during the COVID, the first month, for example, I was in Oman when China closed the borders. Some desalination plants were really worried because, I mean, every component of desalination plant is exported. Uh, uh, sorry, imported from the, the Chinese market, and uh, the, even the chemicals, membranes, etc. So we need also to invest in local components and local, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, local, uh, what we call localizing the technology, and also obviously capacity building. I mean, creating a generation of people who can really uh, uh, who understand the technology and can we can rely on to operate and maintain the, the plants. So uh, again, uh, uh, I mean, the, the Morocco uh, is 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 going the right way, but obviously we need to accelerate more effort. And uh, I rely also, I, I, I think that universities like UMCSP can play an important role in also in pushing their R&D in this very uh, important area of energy transition, uh, renewable energy efficiency, green hydrogen, to really uh, help the country achieve net zero by 2050 and obviously impact on the socio-economic and environmental uh, uh, aspects in the, in the country. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Jawad Al-Kharaz, for this really insightful presentation. Thank you for sharing with us the very important work that you're conducting and also offering us these insights on the gaps that are still to be covered and that we need to work towards all together. Thank you so much again for your 
presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen, unless there are questions in uh, the room, I would, uh, any questions in the room? I will take one question just to keep on schedule and then we'll move on. Thank you. Yes, uh, hello everyone. I'm uh, Professor Sabot. Uh, I am specialized at decarbonization and um, uh, energy transition. I work at uh, ASEAN UM6P. So I have two uh, basically comments or can be as well questions which are more uh, high level basically. So my understanding just thermodynamically speaking, uh, the global warming would mean that we'll be having more water in the atmosphere and which would mean that we'll be having more precipitation uh, in the world globally, probably is not really evenly distributed. The higher concentration of CO2 in the, in the atmosphere would also lead according to, if I understood uh, very much the, uh, well the, the presentation, so it will lead to more growth of plants. Can we count on this uh, self uh, uh, system to uh, really rebalance the CO2 emissions that exist in the atmosphere? Thank you for your question. Who would like to take this one? water cycle, which is the precipitation rate that we, we have We just now. need you to put the mic, please. Yeah. Thank you. And um, it, uh, on a global scale, the argument that you bring is correct. There's uh, more water in the atmosphere and it accelerates precipitation and evaporation. But the devil is in the detail. Where? In some places it accelerates and in some places it decelerates. So on a global scale, yes, that is uh, well known, but it's the, it's the regional differences, and that's why we use Earth system models to simulate, or else we would uh, just go with the back of the envelope global number. Thank you. Yes, you would like to bring uh, an insight? I just may add some, some uh, comment in addition to what Dara said. I mean, it's true that at the beginning of this CO2 measurement issue, a lot of people said that more CO2, which means more crops. However, you have to, and it, it should not analyze this as one, one way. You, you should analyze this globally. More CO2 means more sea surface temperature. More sea surface temperature means a perturbation of oceanic current who are the driver of the climate. So I'm very skeptical. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope that uh, answered your question. Any final question in the room? All right, I'd like us please to give a round of applause to our three distinguished speakers. Thank you so much again for participating. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on now to our next session of the day, which is about the revolution of cold fusion. And I would like you please to join me in welcoming to the stage uh, Dr. Grégory Chaitin, Professor Raphael Yogier, and Mr. Mohamed Zeki. Please, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the way this session will be conducted as our guests are taking place is we will welcome again. We will first hear a very quick introduction by Professor Raphael Yogier, followed by the much awaited talk by. Uh, Grigory Shaitin, which we had the privilege to hear from yesterday. Um, he was here yesterday and he gave us a taste, an introduction about this session. And then we will have some uh, final remarks by Mr. Zeki. So, gentlemen, we are here to hear from you. Take it away. Thank you.
So to start off this session, we will first hear an introduction from Professor Rafael Lugier. Just to, um, because I'm not a physicist, as you know, I'm not even a mathematician. So just the point of view of the philosopher of science is that we can't avoid to, to see that it's one of the, the idea of fusion is actually what the alchemist called transmutation. And it's really um, some kind of a universal dream. It's even strange that it is so universal because you have alchemy in China, this idea of alchemy in China, in the Chinese civilization. You have the idea of alchemy in the Indian civilization. You have it in, you know, in, even related to Hinduism. You have it related to Taoism. It's very strong in Taoism, this idea of alchemy. And of course, you have it in what is broadly called the West. Um, and, you know, from really ancient time in Greece, and there is a, a specific school that is called the, the School of Alexandria that is, uh, that's founded all these uh, alchemistic myth in the medieval age um, there, from a text that is called Hermes Trismegist. That is a very famous text that is part of the general culture. And basically, the idea is with is that we can transmute all elements in nature while you have found that you will find the key that is inside matter and what believed the alchemist it's also that the key that is really inside matter what we could call like uh, microphysics <laughs> like alchemical microphysics like really inside inside deep inside matter is directly related to our being, our soul. So when you transform, when you transform matter, in the same time you transform your own self. There is this kind of a, this 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 belief. So uh, what is interesting with alchemy also it is that it's a dream. It's magical. It became like some kind of a, even a spiritual movement. Uh, but in the same time, it gave rise to uh, modern chemistry and science. You know, so there are very interesting things that comes out comes up from uh, from alchemy. And I'm wondering if this idea of fusion um, is or is not in the continuity of this alchemical this dream of uh, transmit transmutation that gives uh, almost, a, I mean, a, a godly power to human onto the material, the material world. Um, maybe it's not random if, to my knowledge, the most expensive research program in all the history of humanity is actually about that and from now, I don't think we have seen any result, any really concluding result um, uh, on, that, on that thing. So basically, are we going to be able to um, break what is called what the uh, electrostatic repulsion between two positive particles? Are we going to be able to do that? If we are able to do that, that means that we can make um, helium out of hydrogen and so on. Is it really possible to do that? If we are able to do that, fusion, what is called fusion, not fission, that means in a way we will solve so many problems of transition. That it will not be only a simple transition. That could be the end of the shortage of energy, that could be the end of so many problems. It will solve so many problems that basically I don't know what will happen. So there are people today that pretend that they actually were on the verge of achieving this 
or even that they actually did it. There are, of course, there is, of course, the ITER, and I, you are going to talk about it in Provence, where so many people, so many scientists, so, many, so much money are gathered to try to solve this problem, but on a thermic, uh, on a thermic way. And there are other people that pretend that they are about to succeed with laser in the US, I think, or maybe in Japan, I don't know, we talked about that. And there are also people that say that they can even achieve that, not on a thermic way, it's called cold fusion, would be possi possible in another way? I mean, I ask you, you both, like uh, mathematicians, very interested in physics, and an engineer, is that possible? Is it true? Thank you, Professor Rafael, for uh, this introduction. We'd like to hear from you, Professor, and then the idea is to have a conversation. This is a really short session. It's a 45-minute session, so it's kind of going to be a conversation between all three of you. Thank you. Um, uh, hi, good morning. I think I'm next here. Uh, thanks, Rafael, for that beautiful historical introduction. Uh, this is an old dream, as you say, alchemy. Um, listen, this morning we heard about what this region is doing to face uh, climate change. Very important work. We're blessed in this part of the world that solar energy is uh, inexpensive and readily available. And there are initiatives with uh, green hydrogen, which I think are wonderful. Uh, there is a chance, however, that there may be some revolutionary uh, new technologies coming. There's a chance. It's, it's not clear yet. And I'd like to tell you about two of these projects that I believe are very serious and for real. But, you know, until it happens, nobody will believe it. And um, I believe it, but... Um, you're not going to believe it. Um, <laughs> and um, the, 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 the best effort that I know in this direction is a national Japanese effort that, strangely enough, people outside of Japan don't know about very much. But in Japan, it has tremendous institutional backing. Um, they don't call it cold fusion. Cold fusion is a dangerous word. Uh, it's not clear, actually. It's, this is alchemical. What looks like it's, it seems to be some kind of nuclear rearrangement. It's, it's a new kind of nuclear reaction. And um, the, the group that is doing this uh, is actually a very large group, including Mitsubishi, uh, from which these ideas emerged from 30 years of research in their laboratory. And it also, another partner in this is the largest manufacturer of boilers in uh, Japan. I think it's called, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing it, Miura. Anyway, they say they are going to have a commercial product next year. It's going to be an industrial boiler. And they say that they think they have solved the problem of global warming. Now, if you do have a new technology, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, a new source of energy, even if you've solved it in the lab, you know, it's, first you have to make it into commercial products, which is not easy. And then maybe it takes 30 years until it rolls out. So, and naturally, people are going to be very skeptical uh, until they start seeing changes happen. So the, the, these Japanese people, when they presented outside of Japan, um, I listened to a presentation of theirs. And at the end of the presentation, the lady said, you, you're not going to believe this. You think this is crazy. Too good to be true, right? And she said, well, the Wright brothers, were thought to be crazy. So we're just going to be crazy and we're going to keep going and we're going to do it. Okay, that's great, but it's true that you're skeptical until you actually start seeing it happen. So what is this Japanese effort? 
you can go to a website called Clean Planet. I think if you look up Clean and Planet in Japan, you will get the Clean Planet Japan website. And it's a very nice website in,、uh, in English with a lot of information.、Um, and here is what their technology is like. So, this would be a black swan event if this actually works. But if it actually works, I may not be alive to see it because these things take time. But a lot of you will be alive, God willing, to see it. So the technology works like this. The original、uh, Pons and Fleischmann, you were using palladium as a sponge for, for deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen. And、um, this would not be a reasonable technology because palladium and deuterium are too expensive and dangerous. So, guess what? They're now using nickel instead of、um, palladium, which is. Not dangerous and is very inexpensive, and copper. And、uh, they're using ordinary hydrogen, not heavy hydrogen. And the way their device works, it's a roughly tabletop sized device. You can see it on their website. It, it's nickel, a nickel matrix that has nano layers of nickel and copper. And somehow you stuff hydrogen into this, the、um, nickel lattice,、uh, into the nickel lattice, and then some magic happens. And this gives off、uh, energy, heat. It gives off heat. Now, there's something I don't understand about this process because you've got a, this is not cold. It's not. Uh, it's actually, I don't know, 500, 800 degrees,、uh, the temperature at which this device operates. And、uh, you've got to heat it up. But after you do that, it seems that you get、uh, more, substantially more energy coming out than you put in. So this is heat. So this is this alchemical dream.、Um, Now, this produces no radiation, they say. It doesn't contaminate, but you do get some of the hydrogen,、uh, you do get some、um, synth nucleosynthesis, like happens in、uh, astrophysics.、Um, but none of the elements that are produced by nuclear rearrangements、um, <clears throat> are not radioactive and they're not. Dangerous. So they claim that this, this device is very safe. It's, it's, it's inexpensive because you're using nickel and copper and hydrogen. And they have lab prototypes.、Uh, you, you can read、uh, experiments uh, that they've published. You can see the photographs of the lab prototype and its characteristics. It's a device. Roughly like this. And、um, uh, let's see if actually they come up with a commercial、uh, product next year, like they're saying they will,、uh, which will be an industrial boiler. So I recommend those of you who are curious, it's natural to be skeptical,、um, you know, uh, but uh, it just,、uh, my belief after following. This for many years is that they are for real. It involves, you know, Mitsubishi, the largest boiler manufacturer in Japan, the Japanese government, the Hoko University. You know, these are serious players. Uh, 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 and, but they recognize that outside of Japan, nobody believes it, right? It's too good to be true. Well, we'll see, right? The wait will not be so long. I've been waiting 10 years. I've been following this company, it was created 10 years ago, Clean Planet, and I've been following it very carefully,、uh, hoping I would live long enough to see <laughs> whether it works or not. And it's, it's getting close. So、uh, stay tuned. And then there's a more radical device. Maybe I've used up、um, too much of my time. We were hoping to have Randall Mills talk here this morning. And、um, 
um, scientifically, what he's done is very interesting. He believes he's discovered what the dark matter is, the mysterious dark matter that Avi Loeb talked about. And he believes it's a kind of hydrogen he calls hydrinos, in which the electron is closer to the proton than is normally thought possible. The only problem with this is it contradicts quantum mechanics, which is the reigning theory of physics. So uh, f physicists dismiss it out of hand. Um, however, um, uh, M Mills and his people have uh, a series of experiments showing that they've created these hydrinos. And um, this uh, is what Mills believes to be the dark matter, and he believes it to be the source of energy in the solar corona, which is mysterious. The solar corona is much hotter than the solar surface. And he thinks this is also a new technology, uh, and what he does is he creates hydrinos. He has a device, a lab prototypes, uh, that create these hydrinos, which gives off very bright light, ultraviolet light. And then the idea is to wrap concentrator photovoltaics around the uh, reaction cell, and this will give you electricity. So as a technology, it involves uh, plasma and electrodes, and um, it's a more far-fetched technology from an engineering point of view. The Japanese effort is a much simpler device, uh, looks more, more reliable, easier to manufacture, easier to maintain. But um, if Randall Mills is right, if, the, if he actually has created hydrinos, this would be rev revolutionary new science. And I would beg anyone here who's an experimental physicist to take a look at his website. That website is called uh, Brilliant Light Power, is his company. And Randall Mills is the CEO and the chief scientist. And um, there's an, an immense amount of information on that website, almost too much, including uh, ex experimental evidence for the existence of hydrinos and all kinds of stuff. So please take a look. So, okay, I'm sure all of you will think this is completely crazy. It can't be. But, uh, you know, nature can surprise us. This could be a black swan event. It is, you know, uh, who knows? I, I, I agree that even the, the Japanese group themselves, uh, who are claiming they've solved in principle, they've solved the problem of global warming. They admit it sounds unbelievable, you think we're crazy, but we're gonna do it anyway, they say. So let's see, let's see what happens uh, if next year they really come out with a commercial product, an industrial boiler. And if they do, that means that the human race has gotten closer to alchemy, the old dream of alchemy, and it may possibly be important new technology uh, for the human race. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Okay, so it's very difficult to talk after uh, Professor Shaitin. Uh, uh, so I'm an engineer and an economist and uh, Naturally, as an engineer, we like to see the problem and to spend some time on them in order to solve them. And at the same time, uh, we try to be sceptic when someone brings something to us which is a wonderful solution, which is going to solve all the problems. So, personally, I, I studied and I got my diploma in 78, and I have a very good friend. Uh, we were both at school, playing volley together in the, in the team. And he decided to go to the CEA in, in France because already he told me fusion is something if we found the key is going to solve really all the problem of the uh, energy. So I, I listened to him, of course, and I found it wonderful. And I said, yeah, that will be great. And from my side as an engineer, I want for finding oil, drilling around the world to find a solution 
which were most short term because at this time in 78, if you remember, we had problems fine in, in some areas, uh, mainly in America, people were queuing to fill their tank for their cars. So I work on something which is more short term. Second thing I would like to tell you is, uh, if, again, uh, after this, we had uh, some Belgian guy, who very smart, we came and say, okay, if we use a plane and if we charm some molecules, we are able to find the fields, to, to find the area where there is oil and gas in, in the sea without having to drill. And again, that was something such wonderful that a lot of people trusted him, and mainly in the state. I think it's, in France it was uh, uh, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, who was an engineer, but he still, it was so beautiful, so wonderful, that they wanted to trust. So they trust him, and after a few years, and after having spent something like 300 million French francs at this time, uh, they get a scientist's guy from the CEA who came to see what was going on, and he made a small test, and then they realized that everything that people were selling was just nothing, and forget about it. Then again, another experience which is more personal uh, in uh, because a few years ago, the same thing. We, we, we knew that the world is going to need energy because, as you know, the world is still using more and more energy every day. And we knew that gas is much better than oil. And so we thought, OK, maybe it's something that we should do, bring gas to the people so there will be less CO2 emissions and using coal. So that's short-term solution. And uh, we knew that in the uh, Yamal Peninsula, north of Russia, if you, you see the map of the Siberia, there is a big arch. There is plenty of gas, but the problem is that in this area, you have permafrost and you have ice for maybe six years or six months every year. But we had gas there, and there was two solutions. One is to try to lay a pipeline and to, to join Europe, and the other one is to build uh, tankers where we can put LNG, liquefied natural gas, and with these tankers, bring them to Europe or to Asia. Uh, at, so the people, the third time, they were saying, we would like to have tankers which are ice breakers, because you have ice in all this area. So it, it looked like something crazy. How can you have a big boat carrying all this LNG and still being an ice breaker? So at the first, I was skeptic. And I thought, no, probably the pipeline will be the best solution. And then, again, some smart people, scientists worked on it. And uh, after one or two years, I think they, they show us some results that they had uh, in the uh, test in the basin, and they said it worked. And actually, it worked just because instead of having the boat moving ahead and breaking the ice, he has to go the other way, and with this propeller, he was able to break the gas and, and work in the other way. And it was a solution, and it works. And again, uh, in 2021, 2022, when Europe was needing gas because Russia stopped sending gas for the war, uh, what saved Europe is that we were managed to get this LNG coming from Yemen LNG to Europe because it stopped the gas from pipeline, but it didn't stop the gas which is coming from the sea. So that was the uh, uh, free experience, which shows, as I told you, I'm an engineer, an economist, so an engineer will try to solve problem, and an economist will always say there is in one side, there is another side. So for this subject of the fusion, uh, again, there is one side and there is the other side. We have to keep watching what is going on. We have to try Again, to have the best mind today to look to the problem and to understand if it's going to be like the uh, avion renifleur or if it's going to be maybe like the tanker brisk glass which allow us to save uh, people from freezing in 2002 in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you to all three of you for uh, bringing us these uh, insights. I'd like to see if there are any questions in the room. Yes. 
If there are uh, no questions in the room, let's give a round of applause again to our three distinguished speakers. Thank you so much. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on now to our next session on uh, quantum views on transitions. Joining us today are esteemed scholars who bring unique insights into the intersection of quantum theory and transitions. This session will be delivered both in French and in English, so make sure you grab a headset if you need one. If we could get some headsets um, in the front row from the team, that would be um, amazing. So today we are honored to have with us Monsieur Hervés Virne, Mr. Matthew Leifer, and Jeffrey Barrett. Let's please give them a round of applause as they are joining me on stage. Um, bienvenue, welcome to you all. It's a pleasure to have you with us here today. Still waiting for uh, our third speaker. And we'll start with you, Mr. Hervé Zvirne. You are the former director of research at CNRS and now a researcher associated to the Laboratory of Mathematics of the Normal Superior School of Paris, as well as the Institute of Philosophy of Science. We'll first listen to your intervention, then we'll return to you for the questions at the end. I ask you, under your applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. First of all, I would like to say that uh, it has been a real pleasure to be here during this week at this wonderful event and, uh, and to discuss with many very nice guys about very exciting subjects. So I wanted to say that I, I, I am very pleased to, to talk here and I wanted to thank the uh, organizers for the invitation. Uh, why including uh, quantum physics session inside an event about transitions. The reason is simple. Uh, quantum physics has been a strong transition in the paradigm of the way we can describe or understand the world in which we live. And uh, uh, the transition from classical physics to quantum physics has brought a lot of new things that I will like to present in the first very basic and simple way uh, in my talk. And then my, my two friends will give more details in, in their talks. So I'm going to introduce that very simply and basically. Classical physics is constituted of uh, several theories. The first one is the Newtonian mechanics that describes the dynamics of bodies subjected to forces such as gravity or contact forces during collisions. The second theory is included in classical physics is the electromagnetism, uh, mainly uh, invented by Maxwell, that describes the behavior of bodies electrically charged in electromagnetic fields. And the third one is the thermodynamics and the statistical mechanics, uh, statistical mechanics mainly invented by Boltzmann, but of course many others, which describes the behavior of gases. What we can say is that classical physics, there's three theories, was everything physicists knew until the end of the 19th century. And apparently they were satisfied with that, this is a quotation that is very often used. Uh, this quotation is not probably, is not totally uh, correct, but it is often used and I, I used it because that show the spirit of the, of the, of the time. Uh, Thompson said, it seems probable that most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established and the future truth of the physical science are to be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. 
So that was roughly saying we roughly know everything we have to know. But he identified two clouds. The first one is the inexplicable results of the Michelson and Morley experiment showing that the speed of light is the same independent of the move of the Earth, which is incompatible with the existence of the ether, which was supposed to be the material support for uh, light. And the second one was the failure to account for the radiation spectrum emitted by a black body. So there was just two clouds. And the solution for those two clouds was achieved first by Einstein with the special theory of relativity in 1905 and by Planck, who find a way to solve the problem of the radiation spectrum by assuming that energy was not continuous, but was exchanged through quantum of energy, which allowed then Einstein in uh, the same uh, year that he invented the special theory of relativity in 1905 to explain the photoelectric effect and that's the reason why he won the Nobel Prize in 1921. And then, roughly 20 years after, uh, to discover the quantum mechanics in the modern form of quantum mechanics. And many names are associated with this creation, what we physicists call the, the, the founding phases, uh, with the image of Bohr, Heisenberg, Pauli, Schrodinger, Dirac, and many others also. And this is what I'm going to describe. So classical physics is usually taken to be Newtonian mechanics, electromagnetism, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics, and we also add special and general relativity. General relativity has been the theory of gravitation discovered by Einstein in uh, 1915. And we add also relativity because even if uh, the, the two theories of relativity have introduced big changes in the way we see the world, they are still compatible with a certain classical view. I'm going to explain that. And uh, the whole corpus of theories which we call classical physics is to be opposed to quantum mechanics, who came in 19, uh, 1925 because uh, classical physics could be considered a very a, a friend view of the world. It is totally compatible with uh, the, the view we usually see the world, while uh, quantum mechanics is a devil because it changed everything. Classical physics roughly say the following things. The physical systems studied have properties in proper which are described by the state. And the state of a system represents all the physical property possessed by the system. And these properties are in no way dependent on the fact that they are measured or that an observer is present to see them. The physical theory used make it possible to express the state in a mathematical form and to predict its evolution over time. So that tenets, uh, the, the, there's three tenets that uh, constitute what we call the, the, the scientific realism that is compatible with classical physics. The first one is the metaphysical realism, which says that there is an external reality that is independent of any observer or of the knowledge that any observer could have about it. That's external. The second tenet is the thesis of intelligibility of reality, which says that this independent reality is composed of entities that are in principle describable and understandable. And the third tenet is what could, call, what could be called the epistemic realism, which ascribes to science the role of describing and explaining the intelligible reality and claims that our good theories give an adequate description of this reality, which is corresponding to the picture given by them. 
The three tenets are what constitute the scientific realism, and this is something that is totally compatible with classical physics. That's the reason why I say that classical physics is a, a friend, uh, framework to understand the world, while uh, quantum mechanics uh, breaks that, because it's no more possible, as I'm going to explain, to continue to uh, stay inside this uh, scientific realism. So I'm briefly going now to explain the very simple reason why quantum mechanics is incompatible with this simple scientific realism. The first one is what we call the superposition principle. Uh, we could be in Marrakesh. Some of us have been there this morning, and we are all here in Bulgaria. And this is the way physicists write the state, being in Marrakesh or being in Bulgaria is with a bar and a bracket. That's the usual standard notation in quantum mechanics. And of course, in classical physics, you can be in Marrakesh or you can be in Bulgaria. But the superposition principle, which is caused by the fact that the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics is linear, says that for all states that are possible, any linear combination of this state is possible. That means that the state Marrakesh plus Bulgaria is possible. But what, where it is? Is it in Marrakesh? Is it in Bulgaria? Is it in the middle of Marrakesh and Bulgaria? And uh, quantum physics says that it's not the case. The value of your position, if you are in this superposed state, is not defined. And this fact that when you have a superposed state of defined value for a property in general, that could be applied to position, to momentum, to spin, which is an angular mom, uh, uh, momentum, or uh, for energy. And when a system is in that kind of superposition state, uh, then the value of the property is not defined. I'm going to come back again let, on, on this point. A second point is the rule of the observer. You have in quantum mechanics two principles for the evolution of a system. The first one is the Schrodinger equation, which is a linear and deterministic equation, and you have to use it when you describe the evolution of the system if you make no measurement on the system. And the second one is often called the reduction principle or the collapse of the psi sometimes, and quantum mechanics says that you have to use that if you make a measurement on the system. So, apparently, there is no problem because you have two different kinds of situations. In one situation, you use one principle, and in the other situation, you use the other principle. And those two principles give very different results when you apply them to, to, to the state of a system. So, what is the problem? The problem is what is called in quantum mechanics the measurement problem. It is, it's not possible to define rigorously inside the formalism of quantum mechanics what a measurement is. And as soon as it becomes impossible to define what a measurement is, you have the problem to decide when you have to use the Schrodinger equation and when you have to use the reduction principle while there's two principles doesn't give at, don't give at all the same results. So, one of the possibilities, I have written the only possibility, but some physicists are not, uh, are not agreeing with that, but I would say that the, the, the only possibility is to say that a measurement is done when an observer takes note of the result. That has already been said by Voigt Neumann at the very beginning of the quantum mechanics. And that is something that is totally different from classical physics, where the observer is only witnessing something existing independently of him. In quantum mechanics, it seems that the observer has to play a very active role 
in uh, the act of measurement. So I come back to the supposed state, Marrakesh plus Bengaria. I say that the value is not defined. And actually what happens is if you measure the position of somebody who is in this strange supposed state, then you can always have only two results. The first one is it's in Marrakesh, and the second one is it's Ben Guerrier, and that happens in a probabilistic way. You have half a, uh, a, a probability half to be in Marrakesh or a probability half to be in Ben Guerrier. And this is totally general. In general, when you have two superposed states like that, A and B being defined value of some property, then you can find either A or B if you perform a measurement of the system with a probability half. So there is a natural way of thinking that this only means that before the measurement, the system is already in A or in B. That means you are already in Marrakesh or Bangin area. But this represents a set of systems, half of them being in one of the value and half of them being in the other uh, value. But this is not possible for reasons I, I have no time to enter in, mainly due to the fact that when you are in a superposed state, you can generate what is called interferences by, that you can witness uh, doing other measurements. So the only possibility is to say that before you make the measurements, the value is not defined, which is of course very strange because in classical physics, systems have defined values. I briefly mention also uh, entanglement, which is a very strange thing, and uh, this is often called the second revolution of quantum mechanics. Uh, in some cases, two systems having interacted must be considered as a unique system, whatever the, the distance between them. So I just give it, uh, I'm not going to explain what that means because that would take too much time. But what I can say to explain what is, what entanglement is, is that when you have a pair of particles that is in the state, if you perform a measurement on one of them, then there is a strict correlation for the results that you're going to get on the other particles. And this is true instantaneously, and whatever the distance between the two systems is. And that is uh, often called non-locality, what Einstein, who was worried about that, called spooky action at a distance, because it is not possible to assume, as I said before, that the value is defined before the measurement. So you have, in a way, to think that doing something at one point on one system has an effect on the other system that could be very far away. And of course, physicists are working to understand that, uh, trying to understand how it could be used, and it cannot be used to transfer information. That the, the most important point is not in contradiction with special relativity, because you cannot use this entanglement to transfer, to transfer information instantaneously. But nonetheless, this is a very strange property that is uh, largely studied in, in physics and that is totally uh, absent, of course, in classical physics. So all these strange points have resulted in the fact that physicists have tried to understand that giving what is called uh, interpretations so there are many, uh, of course, not time to uh, go through everyone and to describe their differences because there are many common points, but there are also many differences. Uh, I just uh, uh, list here some of the uh, well-known interpretations. And uh, the, the point is that in all these interpretations, the classical realism must be abandoned. The main points are that it's not possible to consider that systems have always well-defined properties, 
as it is the case, of course, in classical physics. Reality cannot be considered as composed of well-defined objects with objectively, that is, without any observer, uh, with objectively defined properties. Uh, it is the observation by a conscious being that creates the fact that a property becomes defined and it is defined only for the observer. This point is largely debated uh, among physicists, but th this is the way I see the, 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 the problem. Uh, two entangled systems separated by a possibly great distance should be considered as a single object, and reality can no longer be described objectively as in standard realism. And I've just had a, a, a last line, which is the consequences of an interpretation that I've called convivial solipsism, console in an abbreviated way. Uh, a consequence of this interpretation is very strange, uh, and it is that each observer has her own reality. And the fact that we think that we live all in the same reality is an illusion in this interpretation. Everyone is living in his own reality. But on the other side, it is impossible to uh, feel that. And we have the illusion when we speak to the other that we really share the, the world while it's not in fact the case. So that's all these ideas, and many of them are debated and are not accepted by all physicists. There are large debate, uh, debates inside the community of physicists, but are a real transition of paradigm in the way we see the world if we compare that to classical physics. So that is the reason why quantum physics has its place in a, in a meeting like that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hervé Zvian, for uh, sharing with us uh, these insights. Everyone is living in their own reality, indeed, even though we have the illusion that we are engaging with each other. Thank you so much for those insights. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce Matthew Liffer, who is an esteemed academic whose work spans the realms of mathematics, philosophy, and theoretical physics, with a particular interest in quantum information theory and the foundations of quantum theory. Matthew's research explores the connections between these fields. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Matthew Liefer. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, my time here this week. And um, I also want to thank Hervé for inviting me to speak at this session and for doing such an excellent job at setting up, um, setting up the things that I'll need. Uh, it makes my job a lot easier. Um, where is the clicker? All right, so um, what I want to talk about uh, here, I've called the second revolution in quantum physics, okay? So um, I want to start by talking about transitions in quantum physics. So um, <clears throat> the, what's called the second revolution in quantum physics, um, the terminology comes from a paper written by Jonathan Dowling and Gerard Milburn in 2003. And uh, they're really talking about the revolution uh, in quantum technologies, okay? So the first quantum revolution is the development of the new laws of quantum physics. The second revolution is technology. Um, now, the second quantum revolution as it stands is really um, a revolution in engineering and computer science. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. I love these subjects, right? Um, but we're talking about things like quantum computers, quantum algorithms, quantum cryptography, etc. So this is a change in how we think about computer science um, and engineering. So instead of calling it the second quantum revolution, I might want to call it the first quantum revolution in engineering. 
The question I want to ask is, is there a corresponding revolution in our understanding of physics? Okay, it does feel to me like there is, because if I look at um, the way people understood quantum mechanics when it was first proposed back in the 1930s and the way we talk about it now, uh, the way we talk about it in a way that's allowed the development of these technologies, it feels like it's different. Okay, so here are the revolutions in quantum physics as, as I see it. So the first quantum revolution, as was mentioned by Hervé, is the, the development of quantum mechanics itself. So this was completed basically in the 1930s. Um, in the old, in, in the version of quantum mechanics, or the understanding of quantum mechanics that we had then, um, the dominant way of thinking about it is what's called the Copenhagen interpretation. And in that interpretation, there was always a split between what's going to be treated according to quantum mechanics and what's going to be treated according to classical physics. According to that theory, that split was necessary. That's how you decide when to apply the measurement axioms. Okay. So to my mind, the second quantum revolution is just taking quantum theory seriously as a fundamental theory. If it's a fundamental theory, it ought to apply in principle to the whole world, the whole universe. And uh, in particular in the 1950s, um, the various people were thinking along these lines, um, but one reason for thinking along these lines is of course, uh, if you want to think about the early universe, you want to apply quantum mechanics to the entire universe and do quantum cosmology and quantum gravity. And certainly, John Wheeler was thinking along those lines. Um, and that's why uh, there was a certain amount of dissatisfaction uh, with the way that we traditionally think about quantum mechanics. Okay, so there are various different approaches, and this was mentioned by Hervé uh, to a certain extent. Um, so John Bell, he, uh, he has a quote from one of his papers that says that either the wave function as given by the Schrodinger equation is not everything or it's not right. So two options for solving the problems with quantum mechanics. Um, I want to expand that into four options, okay? And the four options correspond to what I call the big four um, interpretations of quantum mechanics as they exist today. Those are the four interpretations that I would say have any kind of significant support. Okay, so either the wave function is everything, in which case you end up in the many worlds theory, um, or you have the two possibilities that John Bell was talking about, so you have to add something, or perhaps the dynamics is not right, and you have to do something which causes the wave function to collapse physically. But the one I want to talk about is not anything, okay? So um, this was a possibility that John Wheeler was um, trying to pursue, um, and many other people are, are now trying to pursue. Um, the idea being that you're gonna try and modernize the Copenhagen-ish ideas, the, modernize the ideas of the Copenhagen interpretation to make them compatible with the way that we think about quantum theory today. Okay, so it's nothing, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the other approaches, I'm just going to focus on, on this one. Okay, so what do I mean by not anything? Well, in contradiction, in complete contradiction to what Hervé said, uh, I'm going to say, well, let's look at the classical analogy um, as follows. Right, suppose you flip a coin and uh, it lands, um, but you don't look at it, okay? Um, what are you gonna do if I said, well, what's the probability that it's heads? You'd probably say 50%, okay? 50% heads, 50% tails. And that doesn't contradict the fact that the coin is actually heads or tails, you just don't know which. So those probabilities just represent your knowledge or your information, they don't represent um, a state of the actual coin. If you then lift up your hand and look, you find that, and you see that the coin is heads, you'll immediately switch your probability to 100% heads. That's a discontinuous change. Um, 
but it's nothing surprising. It's just your knowledge about the coin has changed. <coughs> so when we talk about quantum superpositions, so the, the, the standard example uh, due to Erwin Schrodinger um, is to put a cat inside a box. Um, and it's an isolated box. And there's a chance that uh, there's going to be a catastrophic event inside the box that's going to cause the cat to die. Now, this is actually a picture of my cat, Erwin, um, who's named after Schrodinger. And he does actually like to sit in boxes. So, Sometimes people ask, why did Schrodinger talk about cats and not dogs? And those are people who are not cat owners. Cats like to go in boxes. OK, so we can generate this situation that we describe as a superposition of an alive cat and a dead cat. Um, it need not necessarily be some mysterious state in which the cat has indefinite aliveness. Perhaps it could be more like this, the coin, right? 50-50 probabilities. It's just a state of our knowledge. It does not, it's not a representational state um, of the world. And in that case, if I open the box and hopefully find the cat alive, um, then the transition to the alive cat state doesn't need to be mysterious. OK, so that's the main virtue of that kind of approach. Um, now, Copenhagenish interpretations, I would say, are attempts to have your cake and eat it, right? So eat it too. So, you basically want to take that point of view on quantum mechanics, but you also don't want to give up anything else, right? So there are basically four principles behind these kind of interpretations. Um, the first one is that you want to be straightforwardly empiricist about the existence of experimental records. This means nothing else then. If you go into the lab and make some measurements and write down the measurements, write down what you saw in a notebook, then that really exists, OK? That, th that notebook uh, really exists, and the measurement outcomes took some definite value. You might think, well, that's completely obvious. But there are interpretations of quantum mechanics in which it's not really true, such as the many worlds theory. OK, um, now, also you believe that quantum mechanics applies to everything. As I said, we want to, in principle, apply it to the entire universe. Um, but you know, in terms of more practical things, um, these days we can do quantum experiments on systems that consist of, say, thousands of atoms. It's not quite a cat, but um, as we increase the size of the systems, we always seem to find that quantum theory um, applies. So uh, it's reasonable to suppose that that's always going to be true. The other thing it's fairly reasonable to believe is that quantum theory doesn't need to be modified. Because again, it seems like every time we apply it to more complicated situations, it still survives. So these are defensible postulates to, to assume. And finally, skepticism about re being representational, the quantum state, because um, <laughs> we know that a simple way out of the problems with measurement would be to say, oh, no, it's actually more like a state of knowledge. Okay, So that's what a Copenhagenish interpretation is. And um, I just give those four postulates fancy names. That's exactly the same thing as um, what I said before. All right, so, um, sorry, I put these slides in slightly wrong order. But um, there are still two varieties of Copenhagenish interpretations um, which differ on how we think about those measurement outcomes. So an objective Copenhagenish interpretation assumes the absoluteness of observed events. So this says that when a detector clicks, that's a fact. That's a fact about the world. Okay? So if uh, you go into the lab and you uh, make a measurement, for example, you measure the spin of an electron and you find it pointing in this direction, and you write that down, that's a fact. It's a fact not just for you, but for the entire universe, for everybody else in the universe as well. The perspectival option says that's not true. It's basically the opposite. It says that when you make such a measurement and see the outcome, it is a fact for you. But there's no fact of the matter for me. That is, unless I go myself and repeat the measurement or interact with you. 
And this is a bit like uh, what Hervé was saying in convivial uh, solipsism, where in principle observers live in their own reality. That's a very radical statement, and <laughs> I like to believe that most physicists don't really believe in that, but um, it is a possibility. So just to, this is not um, anything that non-experts should understand, but just to try and explain to you that there are people who advocate these kinds of interpretation, um, here's just a list of some of the modern Copenhagenish interpretations categorized in, in those two terms. Okay, so uh, in the last part, what I want to do is make some problems for the objective Copenhagenish interpretations. So right now, we have that the um, objective versions seem quite reasonable, right? The kind of hard-headed empiricist kind of interpretations, whereas the perspectival version seems a bit crazy. But I want to make the objective version seem crazy too. Okay, so how do we do that? So instead of the Schrodinger's cat experiment, we're gonna look at the Wigner's friend experiment. And it's the same, it's the same uh, idea. Instead of putting a cat in a box, you put a friend. So Eugene Wigner was a physicist who came up with this idea. He imagines putting his friend inside a box, and inside that box, the friend is gonna make a measurement. So in this example, I'm imagining measuring an electron spin in the Z direction, and either it's gonna be up or down. The reason for putting a friend in the box instead of a cat is just so that the, inside the box, we unambiguously have something that counts as an observer, right? So I know that when I make a measurement, I see a definite outcome. Uh, so my friend, I assume, also sees a definite outcome. So um, by universality, which means quantum theory applying to everything, I can apply the Schrodinger equation, or Wigner can apply the Schrodinger equation to his friend inside the box, and he'll end up describing that as a superposition of the two measurement outcomes. But uh, the idea that the friend is actually an observer means that from the friend's point of view, they've seen a definite outcome, and so they must collapse the quantum state onto one uh, possibility or another. That's two different descriptions, but again, what saves us here is the idea that quantum states aren't representational, so that can just represent two states of different information, the friend inside the box knowing what the outcome is, and uh, Wigner outside the box, not knowing. Okay, so uh, what causes trouble is what are called extended Wigner's friend arguments, and these are um, a newer development. And uh, I've written a review article about uh, this topic. Uh, the QR code will take you to a link to that article if you're interested. Um, it starts with an extension of the Wigner's friend idea, which I call Wigner's enemy. Um, now, if, if Wigner is describing his friend inside the box according to the Schrodinger equation, the Schrodinger equation is reversible, time reversible. So it means that in principle, um, the physical evolution that caused the friend to be in a superposition can be undone and reversed, and we can put everything back into the original state. Now that's hard to do in practice, but we're doing thought experiments here. In principle, quantum mechanics says you can do it. So uh, I call this the Wigner's enemy experiment, okay, because the friend makes a measurement and then Wigner comes along and resets everything, including erasing his friend's memory. So if you erase somebody's memory, you're probably not friends with them, I would say. Uh, so I call that the Wigner's enemy experiment, and then an extended Wigner's friend argument involves um, combining this with uh, experiments involving entangled quantum states. Now there are various variants of these extended Wigner's friend arguments. I want to give you just a very simple one, which is not the, the most sophisticated or the most rigorous argument, but just to give you a, a, a flavor of what happens. And this argument is due to Shan Gao, um, who's a philosopher. Um, so, and here's, here's how it works. I'm gonna consider, very briefly, four different experiments. So in the first one, uh, Wigner's friend goes into the box, 
and he's going to measure uh, the spin of a quantum particle, and it's going to be prepared in such a way that his measurement outcome has 50-50 probabilities. Okay? So he's going to make that measurement, and then uh, Wigner's going to come along and reverse everything, undo it, stick everything back in its original state. And then, given that he's back in the original state, the friend can go ahead and measure again the same variable. Now, <coughs> in an objective Copenhagenish interpretation, um, there is actually a fact of the matter about what the outcomes of both of those measurements are. So, if you repeat this experiment a number of times, you'll be able to build up, or well, there will exist relative frequencies for both measurements. And you can ask yourself, well, what should that be? What will the probabilities be for the two experiments? And you might want to reason like this. You might want to say, well, Wigner undid the measurement and reset everything back into its initial state, as if nothing had happened. So you might expect that the second measurement would just be independent of the first and have the same probabilities. And that would indicate that you get each of the four possible sets of outcomes with equal probability, quarter each. Okay, that seems like a reasonable argument. The next thing we'll do, we do is we'll just replace the system that the friend is measuring with an entangled state. Um, the entangled state I'm using is slightly different from the one Hervé used. I'm going to use one where uh, the two systems are perfectly correlated. So if I measure the same thing on both systems, I will always get the same outcome. So for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one of the particles inside the box with the friend, and the other one, we're just going to uh, put it to one side, perhaps very, very far away. And we're not going to do anything with it. Now, um, as Eve said, the, uh, the first measurement according to quantum mechanics um, in an entangled state, um, it doesn't have a definite outcome before we measure it. Um, so the probabilities are 50-50, just like they were in the previous case. So you might reason that, well, this is really just the same experiment. What does it matter that there's another particle somewhere? I do the measurement, I undo it, reset everything back to the original, and then I do a measurement again. So surely those two measurements should be independent, and I get probability a quarter for every outcome. But now, what happens if we actually make a measurement on the entangled system? Quantum mechanics tells us that if we make uh, measurements on the two systems of the same uh, quantity, we will get the same outcome. Okay, and uh, we're never gonna delete the outcome or undo the outcome of the other particle. So that's just gonna stay as it is. It has some definite outcome. Quantum mechanics tells us the measurement on the other system has to be perfectly correlated. And so the only possibilities uh, are that uh, both the measurements are up or both the measurements are down. Okay, they have to be the same, otherwise they wouldn't match with the, with the uh, measurement on the system that we've put far away. Okay? This is already slightly bizarre because all I've done is to do something far away. I haven't changed what I'm doing um, here in the box. And that's changed the joint probabilities. Uh, you can make this a little bit more perplexing by saying, well, what happens if I just delay this measurement, the measurement on the entangled particle? Um, <clears throat> surely that shouldn't really change anything because, um, you know, uh, as far as quantum, we're not doing any dynamics on this system. So as far as quantum mechanics is concerned, as far as the formalism of quantum mechanics is concerned, there's really no difference in these experiments. All I've done is change the timing of things. But now there's a real uh, sort of worry because um, on the first system, you know, we may, we may not decide whether to do this measurement on the entangled system until much, much later. So now you have real conflicting intuitions. Okay, so I'm nearly done here. Um, the, what saves you, of course, is that the correlations between the friend's two measurements are inaccessible. I did a Wigner's enemy, right? So 
his entire memory, all the records of the first measurement outcome have to be erased before we get the second one. So nobody's going to be able to check these probabilities. The point, however, is that in the objective version of Copenhagenish interpretations, we insist that they exist. Measurement outcomes really exist, and whether or not anybody knows them doesn't matter. Um, now, if I construct a more sophisticated version of this argument involving more measurements and, and so forth, then you can show that really you cannot use quantum theory in any way to make a prediction for what some of these inaccessible correlations are despite the fact that you're assuming they exist. So uh, you may want to move to a perspectival interpretation in which um, there's never a perspective in which both outcomes exist, right? So when you erase um, the measurement outcome from the friend's memory, um, that's erasing his perspective. And so it's as if when you make the second measurement that he's in a different reality and we don't have to posit the existence of um, joint probabilities at all. But of course, that's a radical alternative, and I'm done now, uh, just as, in summary. Um, so the second quantum physics revolution is, I would argue, to take quantum theory seriously as a fundamental theory. It's at least partially responsible for the revolution in quantum engineering. Um, all interpretations that are compatible with this idea are radically bizarre. So if you try to make a modern, consistent version of the Copenhagen interpretation, then if you're going to be a hard-headed empiricist and say your measurement outcomes just straightforwardly exist, then you are saying that there exist things that cannot be predicted. Um, and otherwise, you have to endorse a perspectival view. So even the Copenhagen interpretation, which is, to some sense, the reason why it's so popular is that physicists think that they're just being straightforward empiricists, even that is uh, radically bizarre. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Matthew Liefer, for your presentation. Uh, now on to our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Barrett is Chancellor's Professor in Logic and Philosophy of Science at the University of California. He investigates solutions to the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. Um, also, Professor Jeffrey applies evolutionary game theory to model empirical and mathematical inquiry. Please join me in welcoming to, uh, to the stage um, Dr. Jeffrey Barrett. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, we've learned in the last 45 minutes that quantum mechanics is counterintuitive. Um, I want to go back to why, counter, why it's counterintuitive um, and what this means for us. And so in, in a way, um, what I'm going to talk about in the next 20 minutes is um, going backward uh, from what, we, what we've just heard. Um, I want to get things as simple as we can possibly get them. The world is a counterintuitive place, it turns out. But we have some theories that make very good predictions. Um, quantum mechanics and special relativity are the most accurate physical theories we've Can ever Can you please had. put the mic closer because we have a streaming on YouTube and I'm told that we cannot hear you well. Thank you. I also, oh, is that good? Uh, yeah, closer to your mouth, please. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Quantum mechanics and special relativity are the most accurate physical theories we've ever had. Um, for some predictions, uh, they make the right prediction to 12, 13, 14 decimal places when we use the two theories together. This is like getting the distance from Los Angeles to Casablanca right to better than a fraction the width of a human hair. It's amazing that we can make measurements this precisely. It's even more surprising that we have theories that make the right predictions this precisely. Quantum mechanics was designed to explain the behavior of simple systems like electrons. It's tempting to think of electrons as like baseballs that have definite positions that move on continuous trajectories, on continuous paths. But it turns out that's not how electrons behave. Quantum mechanics is a theory about how systems like electrons behave. The behavior of electrons is subtle. Um, and so it takes a theory that's counterintuitive to make the right predictions. 
I'm going to use something that we'll call an Albert box. Um, this is named after David Albert um, at Columbia University. And this is the simplest way I know to explain how the world works and why it has to be counterintuitive. Okay, so the first um, box that I want to describe, and I'm going to give these names. This isn't what physicists call the boxes, but the names will help, I think, clarify what's happening phenomenally, what's happening uh, when we make observations in the world. We're going to call this first box a color box, and the dot represents an electron. Our color box has three doors to it. Um, it has an indoor and then two outdoors. The indoor we can throw an electron into. One of the outdoors is labeled blue and one of the outdoors is labeled red. If you take an electron at random and throw it into a color box, it has a 50-50 chance of coming out blue door and it has a 50-50 chance of coming out the red door. I mean, it happens at random. Now we can do experiments by putting color boxes together. So if I have a first color box and I take an electron and throw it in at random, you guys know what the probability is of it coming out uh, blue and red. It's 50-50, it's probability one half for each for a randomly selected electron. But if it comes out the red side of the first box and we gently feed that electron into a second color box, it's guaranteed 100% of the time to come out red on the second color box. Similarly, if I take the electron from the blue door, if it comes out the blue door, and I gently feed it around to the indoor on the second color box, 100% of the time I get the result blue for the second color box. So what it seems like is happening is that the color boxes are sorting electrons into blue and red electrons. Right? This is our name for this property. There's another kind of box that we can build. For our purposes here, we will call it a hardness box. A hardness box also has three doors. It has an indoor that we can throw electrons into, and then it has two outdoors. Um, one is labeled hard and the other is labeled soft. A hardness box works very much like a color box. If we take an electron and throw it into a hardness box, it will come out of one of the two doors, and if it's a randomly selected electron, it will have a 50-50 chance of coming out of each of these two doors. We can line up hardness boxes just like we did color boxes. I take an electron and I throw it into the first hardness box and it has a 50-50 chance of coming out hard and soft. Just as with the color boxes, if I take a soft electron that comes out of the first hardness box and gently feed it into the second hardness box, 100% of the time it comes out soft. If I knock it around between the boxes, all bets are off. And that's true for the color boxes too. But if I'm gentle, then I get 100% um, probability of the first result that I got. So soft ends up soft and hard ends up, soft, ends up hard. We can take the boxes and we can put them together in more complicated ways. And this is the kind of phenomena we see in the laboratory. Let's consider lining up color and hardness boxes. We might be interested in the relationship between these two properties. So I take an electron and throw it into the color box. You should know, right, you've learned how these boxes work. The probability of it coming out the blue side is one half if it's a randomly selected electron, and out the red side is one half if it's a randomly selected electron. Suppose that it comes out the red side on the first color box, and we gently feed it into a hardness box. Now, we don't know what's going to happen yet because we don't know the relationship between color and hardness. So I'm going to report to you what happens. If a red electron encounters a hardness box, it has a 50-50 chance of coming out hard and soft. Color and hardness are not correlated to each other at all. Um, in fact, they're perfectly anti-correlated, it seems. A blue electron has a 50-50 chance of coming out hard and soft, and a red electron has a 50-50 chance of coming out hard and soft. That part we can understand classically. The next step, though, is something that's special about quantum mechanics. Suppose I have an electron and I throw it into the first color box, and it comes out the red side on the first color box and I gently feed it into the hardness box. Now you know from what we've said so far that it has a 50-50 chance of coming out hard and soft. Suppose it comes out the soft side on that hardness box, and then we feed it into a second color box. What happens in this situation is we get 50-50 probability blue and red. The hardness box 
completely randomizes the color property. And it turns out I can't ever know both the color and the hardness of the electron at the same time. If I know the color, I don't know its hardness. If I know the hardness, I don't know its color. It appears that the hardness box, and I say it appears because we're going to see something that changes our view in just a moment. It appears that hardness completely randomizes color. And similarly, it appears that a color box completely randomizes hardness. If I start with an electron and throw it into the first hardness box, it has a 50-50 chance of coming out hard and soft. Suppose it comes out the soft side. A soft electron has a 50-50 chance of coming out blue and red on the color box. That's not surprising. As we saw in the first experiment, color is going to randomize hardness just as the hardness box randomized color. So in the second experiment, if I take that red electron, suppose it comes out of the color box on the red side and feed it into a hardness box, I get 50-50 hard and soft. This is an example of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle with respect to these two properties that we're discussing, um, color and hardness. Now we can set up more complicated experiments than the ones that we've considered so far. Let's take a box and put it on, um, say, a table so that we can do a more uh, involved experiment. This is going to be a two-path experiment. In this two-path experiment, we have two directions that the um, electron might go. It might go on path A or it might go on path B. If I had a hard electron and threw it into the hardness box, that hard electron would 100% of the time go on path A. It goes on path A, it stays hard, and it ends up at the color box. In that case, I get 50-50 probability at the color box of blue and red. Suppose I throw a soft electron into the hardness box. If I throw a soft electron into the hardness box with this setup, that electron will 100% of the time follow the second path, path B, and end up at the color box, and I would get 50-50 blue and red. Because a soft electron gives me 50-50 blue and red at the color box, and a hard electron gives me 50-50 blue and red at the color box. Okay, so let's try another experiment. We're not going to throw a hard electron in. We're not going to throw a soft electron in. We're going to throw a blue electron in. And we're not going to look at which path it takes. We're going to throw the blue electron into the hardness box and then predict how it's going to end up at the color box. Now notice, if I throw a blue electron into the hardness box and I don't look at the two paths, then I don't know which path it took. But let's reason together about it. If it takes path A, then it's a hard electron. And we know hard electrons exhibit 50-50 probabilities when they get to the color box. So if the blue electron comes out the hard side on the hardness box and travels path A, then I get 50-50 probability blue and red. Similarly, if the blue electron takes the second path, path B, and comes out the soft side, then it travels path B and goes up to the color box and I get 50-50 probability blue and red because soft electrons exhibit 50-50 probability blue and red. So on the face of it, it doesn't look like it's going to matter which path the electron takes. It's going to exhibit 50-50 probability blue and red at the color box. When we do this experiment, if we don't look at the paths, what happens is we get 100% blue at the color box. Now, there are a few quick morals that we can draw from this. First off, this experiment illustrates that the hardness box is not really randomizing color at all. If I throw a blue electron into the hardness box on this two-path experiment, I get guaranteed a blue electron at the end of the, of the two paths. If I throw a red electron into the hardness box on this setup, I get guaranteed a red electron at the end of the two paths. The hardness box doesn't randomize color. It's doing something much more subtle than that. Something else is that we ha now have a puzzle when I throw a blue electron into the hardness box, which path does it take? It can't take path A, because if it takes path A, it's a hard electron, and I get 50-50 probabilities at the top if, it, if it's a hard electron. And it can't take path B, because if it takes path B, it's a soft electron, and then I would get 50-50 probabilities at the color box at the end. 
because soft electrons exhibit 50-50 um, blue and rad. So when I throw a blue electron into the hardness box and I don't look at the path it takes, it can't travel path A and it can't travel path B because it comes out guaranteed blue at the end of the apparatus. So how does the electron travel from the hardness box to the color box? Quantum mechanics answers this question. The standard formulation of quantum mechanics tells us that a blue electron in a setup like this is going to follow a superposition of the two paths. It's not going to travel on path A, it won't travel on path B, it doesn't travel on both, and it doesn't travel on neither. It follows the superposition of the two paths. That's when no one's looking at it. Von Neumann, John von Neumann, called this dynamics process two when he was writing down the standard formulation of quantum mechanics. Process two is deterministic and is linear, and it explains quantum interference effects. This uh, two-path experiment is an example of a quantum mechanical interference effect. When we get guaranteed 100% blue on that color box at the end by throwing a blue electron into the hardness box, that's an interference effect. Now let's change the experiment slightly. Now we have the same setup, but we put an observer on path B. The observer on path B is just looking at what's going to happen on path B. The observer just watches path B to see if the electron comes by. Now in a setup like this, how often will the observer see that electron? Well, we saw from our earlier experiments that a blue electron going into a hardness box comes out 50-50 hard and soft. So an observer on path B will see the electron half the time. Half the time you won't see the electron at all. If he sees the electron on his path, that means that the electron is soft. If the electron is soft, it gets 50-50 probability for color at the end of the experiment of, of blue and red. And that's exactly what happens. Whenever he sees the electron, we get 50-50 probability blue and red at the end of the experiment at the top. But when he doesn't see the electron, that means the electron is hard and on path A. If it's hard and on path A, then we would get 50-50 probability at the end of the experiment. And that's exactly what happens experimentally. So when someone looks at path B, it changes the probability for this experiment from 100% blue in the um, color box at the top to 50-50 probability blue and red, whether that observer sees the electron or not. Now consider the situation where the observer is watching path B but doesn't see the electron. That means the observer is not getting anywhere close to the electron, at least not classically but it changes the electron's behavior that there is even a person watching the path that the electron does not take. It gives it now 50-50 probability of uh, blue and red at the end of the uh, measurement um, apparatus. So why does looking at a path give the electron a determinate position and a determinate hardness? And why does it produce random color outcomes? Now we see it's not the boxes that are producing the random outcomes on color. It's observing which way the electron is going that's producing the random outcomes, at least for this setup. The standard theory tells us that observing a physical system causes it to randomly collapse to a state where it determinately has the property once observing. This is what the standard formulation of quantum mechanics says. John von Neumann called the collapse of the state on measurement, on observation. He called this process one. And the way the theory works is anytime you make a measurement, the state of the system randomly collapses to an eigenstate of the observable you're measuring. This process is random and discontinuous. This explains how we get determinate measurement records at the end of our experiments, and it explains quantum probabilities. So the standard formulation of quantum mechanics has two dynamical laws, one for when no one's looking, and a flatly inconsistent law that obtains only when someone is looking. Okay, I want to explain or describe one more experiment we can do with another box. This is called a nothing box. We'll call it a nothing box. It only has two doors. We can throw electrons in and then they come out the other side. On a nothing box, if you throw a hard electron in one side, it comes out the other side guaranteed hard. Soft electrons come out soft. Blue electrons come out blue. Red electrons come out red. The nothing box does nothing to an electron that goes through it. 
And quantum mechanics tells us it does nothing to an electron that goes through it. Um, but it's hard to build these boxes because this is a subtle kind of nothing box. Let's consider our two-path experiment again. Suppose that we just have the original two-path experiment. Ignore the nothing box for a second. Suppose it's not there on path B. We're going to put it on path B. Now, if the nothing box is not on path B, and I throw a blue electron into the hardness box at the bottom of the experiment, and no one looks at the two paths, what happens? Well, you, we've seen that it comes out guaranteed 100% blue at the end of the experiment. If no one looks at the two paths, at either of the two paths, and I throw a blue electron at the bottom, and I don't have the nothing box there, I get 100% blue. If someone looks at the, one of the two paths, right, we get random uh, probabilities 50-50 at the end of the experiment. But we're not going to look at the two paths. We're going to put a nothing box on path B. Now, remember, the nothing box does nothing to an electron that goes through it. It also doesn't do anything to an electron that goes around it. But if I put a nothing box on path B in this setup, and I throw a blue electron into the hardness box, I get 100% red for the final color measurement at the top of the experiment. This is because an electron going through a nothing box, the nothing box does nothing to it. Electron going around it does nothing to it. But an electron that's in a superposition of going through it and around it the nothing box does something to it. This shows that, that um, the electrons really aren't traveling path A or B. They're following a superposition of the two paths. So the standard formulation of quantum mechanics makes precisely the right empirical predictions for each of the experiments we've considered. But there's a problem, and we'll finish with this. The term measurement occurs in the standard theory as an undefined primitive term. Process one occurs if and only if we make a measurement. Process two occurs if and only if no measurement is made. But without knowing what constitutes a measurement, the theory is at best incomplete. And the theory doesn't tell us what should count as a measurement. The problem is more serious than this might suggest. If we assume that observers and their measuring devices are physical systems like any other, and why wouldn't they be? They're constructed of electrons, protons, neutrons, and such. Then the standard formulation of quantum mechanics is logically inconsistent. So this is called the measurement problem. And just as we had a transition from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics, this is going to require another transition. We're going to have to move from quantum mechanics to an understanding of quantum mechanics that doesn't involve the measurement problem. A satisfactory solution to the measurement problem would be a formulation of quantum mechanics that satisfies three conditions. It needs to make the right predictions for experiments like those that we just discussed. It needs to be compatible with our other best physical theory, special relativity. And it should provide a logically consistent account for how we end up with determinate measurement records. So far, there's no formulation of quantum mechanics that clearly satisfies these three conditions. So two quick morals. One, quantum phenomena show that we can't trust our intuitions. We can't trust our common sense. We can't trust our philosophical intuitions about how the world works. The world is a surprising place. And the quantum measurement problem shows that we still have much work to do in describing this surprising place. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to check very quickly if there is any question in the room. We'll take just one question to stay on time. Please, over there, maybe you could ask one question, then we need to keep ourselves on track. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to ask the panel what they think about situations in which there is a collapse of the wave function without any observation. Uh, like the classical example is a radioactive atom that decays at some random moment, or an even simpler one is as an atom in an excited state of energy falls down and emits a photon in a random direction. 
these are collapses of the wave function that are not involved by any observer and apparently not even by any boxes. Let's see, does this work? Okay. It is on. Um, I'll, I can uh, reply to this quickly. In a situation where you have an excited uh, electron, say, that um, falls to a lower energy state, the way that um, the linear dynamics describes this is that actually it's in a superposition of falling to the lower energy state and remaining in the higher energy state. And so the state of affairs is a superposition of a photon being emitted and no photon being admitted and it's staying at the higher state. It's only when somebody looks at the system to observe the photon or not that it causes it to collapse to either the higher energy state or the lower energy state. Uh, that's how the standard theory uh, describes the situation. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take two quick questions because we really want to honor the conversation, the debate happening here. So one first question in the middle and then a final one here. Okay? Yes, please, thank you so much. Go ahead, please. Oh, okay. Hey, thank you, two of you, for this presentation. Uh, we delve into the quantum mechanic world. So, but I would like to talk a little bit about the application of the quantum physics and in general. And one of the big application that big companies are working on today is the quantum com or quantum computers. So, and of course, this will help us to deal with the big, big data, and we will produce and will be more effective compared to what we use in the classical computers. My question is. What about the safety of this new computer that we are designing today? So are we going to face the same problem that we are facing with the classical computer in terms of the safety and the cybersecurity of this data that we're going to produce? Okay, um, I guess I'll take that one because I have worked on this a little bit. Um, as far as security goes, um, you may know that um, quantum computers, if they if we're able to build a fully full torrent quantum computer, then we can break um, RSA cryptography. Okay, so there is uh, that implication for classical cybersecurity, but there are also people are working on cryptography that would work um, even in the presence of that. And it's quite far away right now. Um, there are also cryptography schemes that use quantum mechanics. So, I mean, the, the situation isn't, isn't completely straightforward. Um, we're quite away from really the practical ac applicability of most of these technologies, but it, it certainly does have um, implications for cybersecurity. Thank you so much. Um, I invite us to continue this exchange after this session. Um, and so let's please give them a round of applause. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your participation. Thank you. We appreciate your expertise. We invite you to please join the audience as we're moving to our next session. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time for our final session of the day. Um, I want us to remember all that the aim of uh, Science Week is to bring together top experts and uh, bring you all together here at UM6 Pibengrir for one week contributing to research. As a university, our role is to provide to our students with the cutting edge knowledge. Um, so this week we have extensively spoken about the theme of transitions. That was our theme this year. Now obviously the topic of transitions goes beyond one week. This is an ongoing conversation. A white paper will summarize, summarize all the conversations and your contributions and it will be available and published as soon as it is uh, done, thanks to your contributions and the contributions of the rapporteur. Now, before we say goodbye, I would like to uh, welcome back on stage Professor Raphael Yogier um, as we wrap up this session together. Professor Raphael Yogier, as you know, is the holder of the Transitions Chair. He has played a big role in uh, putting together this uh, content, so let's please welcome him back on stage. Raphael, what a week. I'll make sure to give you a handheld mic. Um, what I'll do is I will uh, go through each day just reminding the audience, reminding us all 
of the different sessions and please feel free to jump in with any you know highlight or question that has been raised and then i will give uh, the final thank you so Let's go through some of the main highlights. Um, on day one, we started with uh, the transition of our minds and mindset with Professor Yogier. Um, anything you would like to share about this specific session? Questions raised. Um, it was a fantastic session. I remember there was a debate with the audience. Um, anything you kept in mind from this session? No, I just, I can just repeat what I said at that time, is that everything must start with a mindset transition before we think about everything else, even the most practical things ever. Nowadays, we know most of the technical solutions because we analyze everything, but we don't really know how to um, actually implement it with, implement them, sorry, with action. So that was the reason why we started with that. Absolutely. That is the role of our mindset and working on our minds. So we started with that as a key uh, theme and then we moved to material transition, right? You remember that session on crystal engineering with uh, Professor Mike Zaborosko. Um, any insight on that session? We had fantastic students that took some notes, but probably something you would like to highlight. Just maybe a, a little thing is that with this session, we could see that what we think is the material world is sometimes, I mean, sometimes doesn't, is exactly what we think is material to the crystals that are certain properties that we would not imagine before the session. Absolutely. And then after the material transition, ladies and gentlemen, remember we moved on to climate transition and energy transition. There we had a fantastic session with Guy Brasseur, Professor Ravi, Paolo Lage and Kenza Khumsi, who gave us the insight on the Moroccan and African context, right? Just, just one sentence for that. It's just in this very session, we could see that it's, it's the session where we will see more than it maybe the other session that everything is related, energy and climate and soil and everything is just very systemic. That was maybe the most systemic session. Absolutely. And on Tuesday, we started with a wonderful session with eight young Moroccans. I see our youth leaving the room. Come on and stay with us. We have some uh, cool things still to, to share with you. Um, please have a seat. Uh, and, and let's, let's give a round of applause au lycée d'excellence de Bengreer. It's such a pride to have them with them. Let's give them a round of applause. They, have been, they are the real uh, scientific lovers because they have been really engaging with us. Yes, Rafael, you wanted to add something mm. about that? Nothing, it's just okay. about an immigration process. Uh, yes, in, so um, we are also process. wrapping up the session, Rafael, for our uh, wonderful audience yeah, for in, uh, ju on just YouTube. Just about, so. about the second day, I think yeah. it was where we understood that transition is also about the future and the future of the young researchers, Moroccan researchers all over the world that are already, I would say, like raising stars. Absolutely. Artificial intelligence. It was such a pride to watch each one of them walk on stage and present us with their technology. It is really a pride to know that Moroccans are performing at the top uh, laboratories in the world. So after that, we moved to digital education. I remember, Rafael, that there was this focus that after the global pandemic that happened, we cannot just wait until another pandemic happened, so we talked through that. Uh, what was interesting, I think, with this session is that to show that a crisis, of course, has negative sides, but the crisis is to experiment new ways of living, and in particular in education. Absolutely. Then, um, uh, Professor Reda Laraki, director of the Game Theory Center here at UM6P, um, also offered us a really highly insightful session on evolutionary game theory. I remember that uh, morning, that was a uh, Wednesday. Um, any thoughts about that? Just the fact that when we think about game, usually we think it's not serious, but we could see that game is really serious. 
It is absolutely serious and it came right after the experience from professors on the field. We heard from Bolivia and that what they were studying about these populations on the ground and the applications of game theory on that. So that was really fantastic. Um, thank you again to Michael Gervin and Zachary Garfield and also Professor Sarah Alemi who were here with us to talk us through that. Following that, we had our session on taking care of the soil with Luis Fresco, Joanne Wallen and Mustafa Benzezoa and Daniel Nao. Remember anything? Yes, uh, I do. So how intense that was. I do, and I just want to repeat something that I say very often is like the soil is not only the soil as we see it on the surface. It's deeper, much deeper than that is the ground on which we live and it's the ground on a system. Everything is coming from the soil and it's coming back to the soil. So without the soil, no transition. Absolutely, and tying back to that, we had a session with the wonderful Kuria Vangari, who, is, uh, who has a, a, her own farm and uh, producing mushrooms, and she talked us uh, through all the initiatives that uh, they were conducting, and there is so much synergy there to carry out. And, and we could see at that time that a global change has to stop local change. Absolutely. And then uh, Professor Shima Beji reimagined, re took us through an imagination to see what uh, smart cities would look like and placing the human aspect at the core of what these smart cities should look like in the future. So that was really insightful. And what, what on the main challenge of our future is to try to not only think on a systemic point of view, specifically uh, countryside on one side or on the other side, the, uh, the urban side, but it has to be a system between urban and countryside it's to be really a global system. Absolutely, a global system. Then we wrapped up the day, ladies and gentlemen, on Thursday morning uh, with the paradigm shifts in science. Um, so we had uh, the privilege to hear from uh, Dr. Daniel Denetegen, Carlos Gershon, and Gregory Scheitin with uh, Francis Heiligen. Any highlights on that, as, that uh, session? Yeah, I think what's interesting with this idea that there is a change of paradigm is uh, allow us to... Um, to to take uh, some kind of a distance with what was called in the end of the 19th century positivism. The idea that we have a direct access to reality. We know that we don't have a direct access to reality. That doesn't even mean anything to say that we have a direct access. We have an access to a certain kind of reality through our conception of the world, even when we think we are uh, a pure scientist. And so we will see that a paradigm is actually a conception of the world and they change and so we see the world in a certain color. Paradigms are like glasses with different colors and we can't get rid of that. Absolutely. And then yesterday afternoon, we had a very interactive session, remember that one, with the French astrophysicist Jean-Pierre Luminet. So there were so many questions. You want to share probably something around that? I mean, there was too many questions and it was so interesting. In the, I mean, it was in the continuity of this idea of change of paradigm because he expressed the very idea that there was the change of paradigm means the very notion, the very view we have of the universe as a whole. Absolutely. And um, after that, I also remember we had somewhat a heated debate. Um, remember that one? Um, Professor Jean Stone. It was hot. Um, and also uh, with uh, Professor Raphael Liogier uh, and Professor Ali Ben Mkhlouf. And we actually loved that session because it also showed us that debate is at the core of what we are learning here. So exchanging points of views and respecting others' perspectives is also part of what we do here at the university. So that was really insightful. I, I think what we had at that time, what is more interesting than anything is that to change the paradigm and to change things, you need controversy. And yes. that was basically, that really was a controversy. 
It was indeed, and uh, we wrapped up the day in a wonderful session with Chef Fatima Hal. That was really a warm way for us to end the day. We had all the students here. Um, we had a wonderful young also student. She talked us through the evolution of Moroccan gastronomy from the past to the future, and that was, I remember, was a wonderful way to wrap up the day. That, that was great, and, and you remember that I'm, I'm fasting because I'm practicing intermittent fasting. And I must say, I was supposed to fast at that time, and when I was watching what I was seeing her, I wanted to stop my fasting because it so, was so fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. There you go, ladies and gentlemen, that was the wrap-up. It was an absolute pleasure for me to serve you this week. My heartfelt thanks goes to the leadership of the university. I want us to thank um, really everyone um, to, Special thanks, of course, to the organizing committee, Fouad Laroui, Said Tezi, Rafael Yoji, Rida Ben Kiren. Nargis, uh, should I give you right now the. the okay, just finish the, the uh, thanks for the committee, and of course, we will have the privilege to have a final say by uh, the president of UM6P. So please give it up to the committee with Fouad Laroui, Said Tezi, Rafael Yoji, Rida Ben Kiren, Nargis Lamrani. Of course, Mehdi al and his events team, and also the technicians, you know, the uh, interpreters behind the scene. I want us to show all our appreciation to all these amazing people, um, and I would like to give the final word to the president of UM6P, Mr. Hisham Al-Habti. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Manel. Thank you so much, uh, Rafael. What a week! So, um, so you, you you mentioned the name, uh, all the names of, of the team. There are other people uh, behind the scene, and uh, first of all, I want to really to thank them for the great job they've done um, to uh, make this uh, fourth edition of the Science Week a real success uh, in terms of organization, in terms of uh, the quality of people we we we, we had. The, this week. Uh, as you know, the main idea behind the Science Week is to bring uh, brilliant minds, scholars, researchers, and uh, our students. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm really here to seize this opportunity to thank the, all the students in the uh, Village of Solutions. Uh, we see what, uh, what uh, UM6P students are uh, capable of. Um, yeah, th there was a lot of things about the sessions, and I think a uh, great wrap-up uh, you, you've done. And um, the, about this very heated session uh, yesterday uh, afternoon, this, for, for me, um, this is the kind of uh, uh, event we should have on a daily basis at um 6 p uh, because without controversy, we cannot push the boundaries further. And uh, this is uh, a great invitation for, for the student. Uh, I, um, I remember the same thing. It was uh, the second edition of Science Week, and it was really very hard. And uh, for me, it was great uh, for the student to see that this is exactly what we, uh, we, we have to respect each other. But in terms of uh, ideas, in terms of uh, what we have in mind, we have, to pull, we have to defend what we think of, and, but we have to be open-minded. Just an invitation to the, uh, to the students to learn from all the sessions, but to learn from what happened yesterday afternoon. This is a really uh, a great opportunity to see how we could, as I said, push the boundaries further and further. Um, yeah, this is the end of the fourth uh, uh, edition of the Science Week, and so will be a fifth one, fifth session. We haven't selected the topic yet, but um, yeah, we'll still learn. We are still learning from the fourth edition, and our our idea is to enhance the quality uh, more and more to give, like yesterday morning, uh, yesterday afternoon the opportunity to the communities to be a part of the Science Week as uh, it was uh, the case for the uh, Laos uh, region and uh, uh, the, um, the other, yeah, the, the, the people working there, the NGOs and others who came, share what they are working on, uh, um, yeah, bringing science, bringing the action from, from the field uh, in, in, this, uh, in this arena. So uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for the uh, scholars, for the researchers who uh, 
uh, honored UM6P by their presence uh, during this week. Uh, La cerise sur le gâteau, it's a uh, concert this uh, this afternoon at Milhoun. Uh, so uh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all at 8.30 p.m. Thank you so much.